Due to some violent content, parental discretion is advised. 063 Marketing, Production and Publishing. Light it up, burn it down and turn up. Elliot's not wearing a shirt right now for the simple fact that he just came off the soccer field practice and it is also very hot this place and he knows there's a lot of women watching this thing. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, it's 80 degrees here in Seattle. That never happens in the springtime, so I'm burning up. We don't have AC in our apartment, so the windows are open, and I'm trying to enjoy it, man. I'm trying to erase some of this farmer tan, you know? <laughs> well, that's why I told you. You started telling me off the air. It's 80 degrees, and I'm sweating, and like crazy. I said, do not bring up 80 degrees around me again today. <laughs> because it's like, you know, it's like 35 here, and there's still snow on the ground, you know? So we don't want to go through all that stuff, you know? But you had 70 degrees last week, and we were overcast and rainy, so I'm not, I'm not worried about it. But overcast and rainy is the norm for Seattle, isn't it? Yeah, but it still isn't good. I mean, but it's normal. Like, are, is everyone, like, extra white in Seattle because it's always raining? Extra white, man. A lot of techie, a lot of white collar techies out here not getting tan. Yeah, nice. Well, the reason why I wanted to bring Elliot Foskey on my show tonight, not just because he's a pro indoor soccer player, because he's also an entertainer. And, you know, what I want to try to cover, and the one thing I love about what I'm able to do these days, I'm able to conduct interviews from here, at Rochester, in my living room, to anywhere in the country. And, and I wanted to have that comfort, that feeling of comfort at your home. We're not looking for anything else. We're looking for, you know, nobody's got to be perfect on this interview. But I brought you in here, Elliot, because I've known you for a few years now. And you're a very fascinating guy. And you have a huge fan base. Like, ladies and gentlemen, whatever this guy does, people are liking, following, praying, hoping, all kinds of stuff for this guy. And as long as I've been following him online... I really don't see a lot about you. I see a lot of these skits that you do um, and all this stuff, but I want to just start from the beginning because I want your fans, especially your fans, to really get to know you today during this interview. That's what we're going to try to accomplish. The good, I don't know if there's even bad. I don't even know if there's ugly, but we're going to try to find a little bit of everything there. <laughs> you okay yeah. with that, Elliot? It's all good. You probably don't have to dig too deep, but yeah. And, and <clears throat> nothing is rehearsed. I'm able to ask him whatever I want to ask him because Elliot, famously, when he's got to think about something, it takes a while for him to get it done on film or camera. He'll get nervous. That's what it is. He'll go over in his head and think about it think about it. So this conversation between you and I is just like we're talking normally. 
and that's what I want to accomplish with this, this show. It's just everyone be comfortable, relax, enjoy, and get to know Elliot Foskey up close and personal. So, um, you okay with that, Elliot? Let's do it, man. It's what you do to me in our free time anyway. Yeah, you Dude. nervous, Elliot? You, you nervous at all? A little bit. You're the griller, man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I know all the women probably want to be nervous because you got your shirt off, and probably some of the guys are going to be upset, too, because they don't have a physique like you, and they got to keep their shirt on. They couldn't do it, you know? So, but I'm going to start from the beginning because, to me, one thing I've always been fascinated about is, um, you know, you're a little bit older. You're not in your early 20s. Am I correct? You're in your mid-20s? Late twenties? You're not gonna reveal. Okay, I figured I tried. I mean, I'm I'm older than that. I, I'm trying to figure out if you're serious or not. <laughs> I was serious, man. <laughs> you, you know how old I am? I I was gonna say. I'm older than all those. I was gonna t- say 28 years old. Dang, we gotta hang out more. Okay, well we'll, we'll tell everyone you're 28 years old. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, cool. How old are you, Elliot? Because you don't mind. I know you don't. No, mind. no, I'm I'm 34. 34 years old, and I always found it. And I was kidding. I found oh. it funny that. Uh, <laughs> You know, you playing soccer this late in your in your in your age, and uh, to me is like, how did you get into soccer at such a later age? Like, were you this kid beating up the playgrounds and you know always wanting to play soccer? I mean, how did you fall into this situation where bam, you're now a pro soccer player? And wh- how old were you when you first signed your first contract? Um, I was a 30 year old rookie when I started playing professional indoor soccer. So obviously that's late in the game. Um, I grew up loving sports. Soccer gradually became my favorite. I played it in college. I had a handful of pro trials coming out of college. Um, uh, the Seattle Sounders, they're in the MLS now, but back then they were in the second division, which was the A-League. So I could have played for them, you know, on a really low contract. I uh, didn't choose to do that two years in a row. Went and tried out in Brazil. Did preseason with the team down there in Goiânia. Lived there for a few months, picked up a little Portuguese, and then came back without a contract. So, what do you mean you picked up a little Portuguese? Well, I speak Spanish, and so it's similar enough to Portuguese that I can get by. You know, I can communicate. Right, right. So, so it was a good time, but I didn't, I didn't get a contract, so I came back. So how did you, I mean, where did you find the motivation after you went there, tried out, didn't get, get the contract? At some point, you would think 30 years of age is sinking in your head. Can I do this? What, you know what I mean? What was going through your head that made you keep, how, how did you stay focused? Uh, well, I didn't stay focused. It was more in the back of my mind. So after I didn't make those teams in my early 20s, I took a couple years off. I just traveled around, um, worked a lot of really odd dead-end jobs all over the place, lived in different parts of the country for a month or two at a time. You, and then You seem to pull that off quite easily, though. Hey, man, there's couches everywhere. <laughs> Since I've known you, you pretty much bank all your money and just couch surf everywhere and make yeah. a nice trip. Yeah, I try to live frugally, man. My my value system is if I can stay debt free, I can be mobile. So, so yeah, so, just. I guess I should have started somewhere else with this, this this interview because I guess I should have started in the beginning. Like, what's that uh, little Elliot Fosky? What what's he doing? Like, as a little kid, like what's going on? You know, just you, you uh, a tough life, normal life. What was going on as a kid? Good, good life, man. Grew up suburb Seattle. My parents, my dad grew up super poor, but stable family. My mom grew up where her dad had money, but there was a lot of, you know, emotional, tough stuff. She basically grew up as a foster kid with her parents in Japan going through a divorce. They sent her and her brother to the U.S. to live with a bunch of older relatives that didn't have a clue about these young little hippie rebellious kids, you know. So my mom was a little teeny bopper hippie rebel. And my dad kind of rebelled against his super conservative upbringing, Norwegian immigrant father, very serious. He grew his hair out long and his dad didn't talk to him that whole year. And they really? lived together, you know, stuff like that. So he, he lit out. He was always hopping trains and hitchhiking and working in the woods. He's always been blue collar. So not super traditional, but at the same time, they had a real stable family for us. They have a great relationship. Um, so is that why he still has long hair now? I notice he has like a very long beard. It might be probably three feet long last time yeah, I checked. Yeah, he's got two dreadlocks coming off his goatee down to his waist. Wow. So, yeah, he's always, you know, I got to attribute most of my attention getting to my dad. My mom's quirky in her own way, but my dad is definitely more the, he loves a, anything that'll open a conversation he's into. So he, his face right now is that conversation starter. Plus young people think he's still relevant. So now that you got a sister and a brother, where do you fall in? Are you the middle child, the older child? Middle child. Middle child. So growing up, was your brother older or younger than you? 
Younger brother. So older you guys sister. kicking a soccer ball around too and fighting over that? Nah, man, he's wired different. I was begging him to play with me. He, he wasn't naturally competitive. He's a decent athlete, you know, but right. he just didn't. I, I love to compete, hated to lose, love to compete. Everything was sports and competition. If I wasn't playing sports, I had my cap gun shooting bad guys in the woods, you know? Like, so Ellie Foskey wasn't, uh, I mean, he was he was in trouble. He was like, he, he's had a lot of energy and played sports. But were you in trouble as a youth? I mean, did you? Uh, no, I, I was a good kid, man, for a long time. I was, you know, good grades, pretty much. I mean, I, I had a really bad temper. That, that was bad, especially from competing. So definitely... You know, if I couldn't beat my dad at something, I would throw the worst fit. And then if I sensed he was letting me win, I'd throw another fit, you know. Wow. I just couldn't win. That's why I don't want kids, man, because that karma, I don't, I don't want to raise a kid like me. <laughs> so I, I, was, I was difficult in my own ways, you know. So how about but a good so, kid. So was your dad just as competitive? Like, if, did it kill him if he had to let you win? Or was, was, was he, did he want to crush you every time? No, it killed him to deal with my attitude. Right. You know, he didn't care if I won or not. He, he was a super athlete. My dad was like quarterback pitcher point guard type athlete three sport athlete and but he said his competitive drive kicked the bucket when he was like 33 or something you know? <laughs> so, and like he was like he remembers the day he said he was like on deck their softball they were in a competitive softball league and you know he was the winning run and he was like yeah whatever you know like it just hit him and ever since then he hasn't been so competitive so wow so we got a little bit of your childhood down i'm sure there's not one viewer probably that knew that stuff about you i'm having to guess because you really don't yeah, talk no. about anything i don't even know why they would you know i don't know what they're gonna do yeah, with this it, it up, you know? yeah i don't know what this what they're gonna do with this information but i just i'm building a little story as we go on even though i started in the middle went back to the beginning so as a child you you had this energy your brother your sister your parents were wild you know this and that now you went to college you stayed you went to college yeah so what did you go to college for play soccer man i i had a little bit of a soccer scholarship my grades were good so i had a lot of financial aid for my grades and the years i went to college my parents didn't have a lot of income and so i got really good financial aid and then anything left over my grandpa said he would pay for it. so i knew that i had a debt-free college experience so i had to complete it you know yeah. so i didn't have any idea what i wanted to be what i wanted to do but i just knew if I could get through college debt free, I wanted to do it. Were so. you were you a standout soccer player in college, or were you just average? Uh, uncelebrated, but I was good. You know, we were. I went into an NAI school. We had won a national championship three years before I got there, and we won a Division II championship the year I left. So without me, so I never won a national championship. But the bookends, so we had solid squads. I, I was always a good player, but never accolades, you know, stats, any of that. Just good blue collar midfielder so, so 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 you had to work a little bit extra harder i'm guessing then to make up for you know no it, no, no it wasn't like that I'm, I'm i'm very skilled i'm just unorthodox you know what i mean like I, I just didn't score a lot of goals i do a lot of gritty physical work i was could run all day i love playing defense i love sticking it to somebody and you know trying to frustrate their attacks and then i would set up the attack so right. I'm definitely skilled, but it's nothing that shows up on paper as, you know, I wasn't recruited to play professionally or, you know, anything like that. I wasn't recruited to play in college either. But at you that know. point, you were pretty focused, though. At that uh, point, did you think, hey, I want to be a professional soccer player? Or were you just playing it to get the grades and get the education at that point? I just love playing. I, I don't know when. I mean, as a kid, I want to be a pro athlete. I want to be Bo Jackson, though, you know, right. baseball and football. But apparently... You know, I'm 120 soaking wet, so that didn't work out. But right, um, yeah. So I always wanted to be a pro athlete, but I didn't really know how to train. To be honest, like I, I worked really hard. I kept myself fit, but I was always kicking the ball for fun. So I improved, and I was a good player by my work ethic. But I didn't focus on a lot of fundamentals that would have made me better. You know, I didn't have a lot of knowledge. We didn't have coaching growing up hardly right. in my generation where I grew up because my family moved to Spokane. Right, and so it just wasn't a big soccer place. Um, there wasn't a focus on it. So I ended up barely getting into Seattle U because our coach was recruiting the team we were playing against and we smashed them. So then he recruited me and a few of my teammates and I ended up going. So um, I, I don't know when I decided I wanted to be a pro, but you know I had the chance to try out for the Sounders and took it. And really it was depression why I didn't take the contract. I would have taken the bad contract they offered me. It was low, but it was an opportunity. But day to day, my motivation was wavering. Right, you know, right. I'd be like 
fine playing, competing. One day I didn't care if I was alive or dead. So I didn't really want to do it halfway, so I quit. How old were you at this point? I was 22. So you were when I first out. tried out with the Sounders, then didn't make it. Then that winter, went to Brazil, tried out, didn't make it. Came back to the Sounders again, same story. You know, little, little contract. Which again, it wasn't about the money, but I just told myself, I'm like, if they offer me a decent contract, I'll do it. If not, whatever. But I just kind of threw, threw it to chance because I. You love the whole I, experience of everything about everything to do with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I love playing, man. And then part of it too is like once you hit the professional level, it's not as fun. Right. It, you know, it's the better your contract, the worse someone else's is. You know, there's always competition. There's there's less of a team unity feel. And I don't know, you're just playing soccer a few hours a day and hanging around these little apartments. And I, I didn't find that life super fulfilling. It was hard to keep my motivation plus some other at stuff going on in my head. At that age. Yeah, I mean, all the time. Honestly, my personality, I've learned about myself. I do need more occupation than just playing sports. Even even now, if all I do is play soccer, I get a little stir-crazy. It, it doesn't feel that productive. Well, that's going to be the good part of this interview because at some point, we're going to start digging into <laughs> a lot of your occupations because to me, it is, I'm evolving to, to, to this thing. By the end of this interview, however long it takes, we don't time our interviews here. We feel we've had enough. We say goodbye, thank you, and all this and all that. But what I want to do is uh, I'm gonna, we're going to take a little break, and uh, we're going to play a track. When we get back from the break, we're going to take off <clears throat> right from where we left off from college. Every person born is given two things in common, a free will and a struggle. Life is full of beauty and resistance. In the face of opposition, will you move aside or will you engage the struggle? It's been said, nothing in your life is worth dying for. Though the body lives, you are not truly living. Not truly living. Not truly living. Not. You know when your back is against the wall Then there's no choice left Zero, but to fight or fall three, When you live three, captive three, and die production. for the cause Fight back the odds till the casket's closed Stars and crowns, I'll bleed to see clear Sweat and tears testify that I'm here Dig deep, dig the neck to the heart and the chest A warrior's before me, you fought to the death Refuse to accept the oppressor pressure I expect success in the face of resistance I've been through it, I fear no man Expose my weakness, they cut me open My wills are broken Humility's deadly, tell the enemy I'm ready to die Come get me, I both the best Sleep with no rest, the irony is I live upon the flesh We live, move, breathe, die, and we'll fly Me, I got vision that's a past with the eye can see it Die you bring the feel the original seed Die the last one he can to be set free Death is a curse only if you never lived Never gave a hundred percent back in If you never gave in the fear You can break every chain Persevere through the pain to achieve anything Dream big, why? Truth can't lie Dreams won't fade, ideas don't die Don't look back, the blind lead the blind Blink twice, see life pass you by Me, I'm a different cut, make life difficult Love, drink from a different cup Magnificent view from the top The chosen few died of the cold What they really are Come on Yeah Breathe Die Yes, we'll fly For being safe, how you would be amazed at the death of a human Souls of state, you stack deep like bodies in a massive grave There's power to the people that die for freedom You can mark my words, I speak belief, I seek relief My speech is in chains, a dying breed I'll join the slain, enjoy the strain, embrace the pain Death gains new life, I'll fight for change I'll spark a blaze, lightning fast Pit fire hydrant when the lightning crash When it's like a flash, over ironclad Fight mad, think back to the I can pass, breathe in, these breath might be your last When I die, I wanna say I came on, I had we live, move, breathe, die, and we'll fly
Boys from Fashion Boys with the great Elliot Frost. And the song you were just listening to was called The Dying Breed by yours truly, Elliot Frosty. Yet another thing your fans didn't know you did. Entertainer, soccer player, all around, right? Yeah, I got a couple hobbies. <laughs> Who produced that track? Just to give him some shout out too. Levi Bennett, B Live Productions. Nice. It was, it was fun. We'll, and we'll get to the music part, too. But yeah, uh, cool. I want to pick right it back up where we left off from. And it was you getting out of college, trying out, not getting that position. So what was going on in your head, you know, during that time when you didn't get it? What, what are you thinking at this point? Uh, you said you were confused. You were depressed. You were up, down. Yeah, I was frustrated, man. I mean, I was frustrated with myself, my lack of motivation. I'm always really hard on myself, very perfectionistic. So... You know, I felt like if I wasn't going to perform to the best of my ability and be 100% focused, and I didn't want to do it. What were what were some of your distractions? Um, honestly, just being... Man, I don't know exactly at that time, but I know the overarching theme was just being hard on myself. Feeling like I had a lot of potential. I should have been doing a lot more with my life. Yeah. And I had no direction, didn't know what I wanted to do. And always feeling like I should just be doing better, be a better person, be better at soccer, be more studious, whatever it was, just really frustrated with myself. And so I actually went to counseling one time um, when it got really bad. And the dude was like, he just told me, he's like, you're such a perfectionist. You think that's elevating you to a higher level. So I always pushed perfectionism. I wanted to be perfect in whatever I did. And I felt like as long as that standard was that high, I was always going to try to reach for it and it would make me better. And then he said, you know, you're never going to be satisfied with yourself. So you just get you give up because you're like, I'll never be happy. I'll never reach the goals I set. And so then it was so disheartening. I would lose motivation. And then it, so it was ironic. It actually wasn't helping. me. What were you, you know? doing during those depressing stages? I mean, were you going out drinking? I mean, what were you doing? Were it just man, I had never drank up to that point. Never touched drugs. Ne you know, I was a virgin. And I was just very that that wasn't my relief. Wait, how old were you? 22, 23. You, were, you didn't do any of those at that point? No. Nope. How does one go? Because I'm going to assume a lot of people you go to school with and a lot of people you're around, they're consumed with all the things that you're not doing. So how do you not yeah. consume with all that stuff? Yeah, even a year or two in my college career, I was I lived in party houses. You know, it was all around me. And part of it was... Well, people knew where I stood, man. I didn't even hardly get invited to parties. I didn't go to them. People knew I pretty much wasn't interested. So if they and see you coming up, let's just say they were drinking or smoking weed or whatever they were doing, they see you coming up, they hiding it because they respect you that much? or Not not quite to that level, but they wouldn't do it around me or would avoid it. So honestly, just by, by the stance I had taken, it was such a non-issue for me. I was just was not going to drink no matter what. It didn't matter what anybody did so no one ever peer pressured me right i never felt the pressure to drink and so i was actually sheltered from a lot naive in a way you know i learned things that were going on in my own house that i didn't know till way later you know yeah. story pop out and i was like man i live there yeah. you know dudes war stories with chicks and all that i wouldn't even be in the loop on yeah wow um so I have friends like you growing up where you know i always commend it especially now that i'm older uh, that they never touched a drug, they never touched alcohol, they never smoked a cigarette. And I commend them because every one of their friends was doing it. They didn't have a problem hanging out with them. Uh, they just didn't do it. It wasn't for them. They had no desire for it. So I always commend high props to people who can do that in life because not everybody's that strong and some people succumb to the things around them. And so I, I give you a lot of credit to anyone who's, who's gone through that stuff, knowing uh, not, not to be influenced by others. I mean, that's amazing right there. Yeah, I never had a problem doing my own thing, you know. I, I was kind of brought up that way. My parents, you know, they're, they're unique. They're, they're kind of a paradox in themselves. Right, right. You know? Kind of hippies, yet conservative Christians all at the same time. Were your parents, were they strict or are you pretty much... Not really. I mean, they, they, they were very strict in a way. Like, we didn't have a TV when I was young. And then they wanted to monitor what we were watching at the neighbors. So they bought a TV and then put it under literally a padlock. And, and like closed off so you had to do this combination open it so you could open the tv really yeah so they could monitor how much we watched and what we watched and so it was a half hour a day was the rule you know 
What did you watch during that half hour? <laughs> Man, for a while, for a while I was smoking my mom because it was like, well, I'm watching sports. That shouldn't count against. It's kind of like what I do, you know. And then the other siblings were like, that ain't fair. You get to watch more TV, so I got that cut off. Man, I, I remember, <laughs> I remember stuff like Ducktales or. Man, I don't know. I don't even remember. That's crazy, man. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. like crazy. That I tell you what. We were very monitored too, what we could watch. It was very filtered. So they're strict in a way, but they gave us so much freedom. You know, I'd be playing in the yard. I'd run around with a BB gun. We were in a suburban neighborhood. You know, I'd be shooting birds, like, and they they let me do that kind of stuff and go fish in the creek and by myself. You know, walk down to the waterfront. We live kind of near the Puget Sound, the ocean down there. So I had a lot of freedom. And if we could give a good alibi and a reason for what we wanted to do, we could stay up and stay out. So you you you, uh, you, you, tr you tried tricking her when you were younger and it didn't work. <laughs> so yeah, this is still honest. This is still what we're doing. <laughs> and, and you know, and and also, I was trying to figure out a segment how to bring this up. Okay, but you've you know, you, like you, you're saying, you've had a decent life. Okay, but you've also dealt with some tragedy in your life. And, and it, the only reason why I, I'm thinking about how I was going to bring this in is you mentioned, and I think it's an important thing to bring up in a good way and not a bad way, is you had a tragedy in your life and with your sister. And seeing how you've never done drugs or anything like that, you know, you want to, I'm trying to figure out how to bring uh, this up, up to that point. Up to that point. So yeah, yeah. How, how were you then? When I first tried anything, yeah, I tasted alcohol like the week before my 25th birthday. So no. So what made you come to that conclusion? Well, I mean that goes back to when I was a kid and why I didn't drink in the first place. So you just wanted when to know? No, I, when I was 10, I made a pact because with you know some of my buddies and my cousins' buddies we were having like a sleepover. And we were all talking about God. We were grade schoolers. I was 10. I was the second oldest one. Right. And I told them. Uh, I don't know who started. We just had those Christian values. We were like, we're never going to drink. We're never going to do drugs. Never smoke cigarettes, chew tobacco. Wait till we're married to have sex. You know, and we promised all these things. And we were kids. So obviously we got older and we didn't all live in the same city or anything anyway. And you'd be hearing about guys and, you know, you're just growing up, going through right. adolescence. So guys start doing stuff and I never did. And, um, and I just stuck with it. So even after, as teenagers, we got together and we're like, hey, man, we're... We're growing up. We're all going to do our own thing. You know, we were kids and we made that and we're like, all right, fine. But at that point, I was like, shoot, I told everybody I've ever been around that this is something I'm never going to do. So I didn't want to lie. And I, I want to stick to my word. That was like really important. That the guy, and the same guys that were going to word for word with you saying, yeah, let's shake hands on this. And that. Were they staying, were they doing the same thing or did they finally, did they quit sooner than you? Oh, no, no. Everybody broke every aspect of it, I think, before I broke one. Really? You know? Yeah, I mean, certainly, for sure. I can say that. Um, and it was, yeah, it was just a funny position because then I was a Lone Ranger, you know? But like I said, I told everybody, so it was no longer even about them. It was like, okay, we can do our own thing, but I'm better for it anyway. It doesn't, you know, I save money, it's healthier, it's something I promise, so whatever. It, it, what um, I was going to bring, it, it was trying to, I'm trying to figure out how to bring this in, but how I was going to bring it is, you had a sister, you know, you're very close to your family, okay? Yeah. You had a sister that passed, okay? Yeah. And she dealt with a lot of things in her lifetime. And I kind of want to just, and I only want to touch briefly on this because I don't want this to be a doom and gloom show. Um, but I also think there's a great message with your sister's life. And that's the only reason why I'm bringing it up. Um, what she had went through and what it has done for you and your family or to you and your family and how it's changed your lives for the better and you know the awareness that has come along with your sister's death and i don't know if you mind touching base this a little bit but you, would you like yeah, to yeah. for a minute no that's good i mean so my older sister three years older she was born with some disabilities they kind of call them hidden disabilities they weren't right in your face mm -hmm. um but she dealt with a little bit of cerebral palsy so physically she you know wasn't as coordinated in certain things so she didn't excel in sports she had some learning disabilities Certain subjects were difficult for her. She got teased a lot, couldn't fit in. Um, she emotionally never really developed beyond that of a child. Um, so she was so sweet, like the sweetest, most giving, open-hearted, loving, non-judgmental person ever. The downside of that was she did not learn 
from consequences. She trusted everybody. She would not get jaded no matter how many times she was hurt. Mm -hmm. And as she grew older, you know, where she was accepted was in the party crowd, drug culture, whatever. And so that's where she found her people. She didn't care who she was around, you know. Right. She could be around the president or a bum on the street and wouldn't know the difference. You know, she loved all people. So, right. so at some point, meth came in. You know, she was on and off of meth for seven years, in and out of jail, a couple of DUIs, on probation, relapse, rehab, you know, doing that whole thing. And so throughout it all, um, you know, you'd lose her. I'd lose her to the drugs and then she'd come back and she'd be sweet and wonderful. And, you know, it, it's just hard um, to watch somebody go away and die while they're alive. You now, know, were you, you drinking at this them. point yourself or not yet at this point? Boy, when she died, what, 07. Uh, yeah, I just dabbled in it, you know, just started. Right. Right. I mean, 06. Yeah, like a year before was the first time. Right. And, and through this happening, you know, because you said it was a seven-year span. Yeah. So that's a lot of things, especially when you're, you know, abusing drugs and alcohol a seven year span is a long time yeah you know so during that seven years I mean what was going through all your heads and you know like are you learning things about you know because you told me at one time you no matter what she was going through you were always tight with her yeah we were emotionally close but a lot of times she was gone right out of the, out of the area disappearing you know dating some criminal dude randomly or she's in jail for six months which those are the clean times. She'd have security, and it was actually kind of good for her. You know, sure. she, she she liked jail. Like she, I mean, she obviously didn't want to go back. You know, certain ones were worse than others, but she had friends there. She had people there. She had security. And she, um, she felt in her mind she fit in there. Yeah, she fit you in know? all these cir circumstances that weren't no right for every mostly mostly everybody else. And she was social, right? Like she she just loved people. Right. She's funny. If you knew her, you know, it was like she just went with the flow. So. Um, yeah. So, so so what I was going through from that was, I mean, I already wasn't doing drugs, you know what I mean, prior to that, and I wasn't worried about it. And I don't want to play with it because on both sides of my family is drug and alcohol addiction. So right. I was like, that was another thing. Like, it's probably just better that I don't mess with it. Yeah. Um, so I didn't. But, yeah, what was going through my head, I mean, I learned a lot of the negatives. I learned to hate the drug culture of hip hop, mm -hmm. you know, like, mm -hmm. I like rap. I like rapping. I like rhymes. I love the creative element of it. But this whole, like, you know, be a pimp, pimp a hoe, sell a girl, you know, devalue her. And then the whole um, drugs, like, I'm just going to get mine, you know? Yeah, yeah. We're cutting up coke, Jay-Z, rags to riches. I did what I had to do. Well, what you had to do is you effed up a lot of families, man. You know, I saw what one drug addict did to my whole extended family yeah. and circle of friends. One person, one sweet girl on drugs. And these drug dealers are trying to hook in more and more people with that stuff. I don't respect that at all. And I can't imagine, you know, what your parents had gone through, but I know through this healing process, I would have to assume it brought the, you, know, you, your mother, your father, and your brother a lot closer, but it also she wrote a book. You want to talk about that book briefly? Yeah, so my parents have a really strong marriage, good relationship, but they grieve differently. And most people who lose a child get divorced, you know, overwhelming percentage. Yeah. And my parents, it was rocky. You know, my mom is the very much doer, shaper, plan, create. And my dad's just kind of go with the flow. Let's see what happens, you know. So my mom wanted to do something in my sister's memory, start a foundation, do something in her name. My dad was just thinking, we'll wait for a good opportunity. If it comes, good. And j just the whole grieving thing, it it's so difficult. You know, you have different needs in grief. So it was really trying on their marriage, but they got through it. And my mom went to a grief class where they had homework writing assignments. And that blossomed into a book. So she wrote a succinct, you know, little hundred page book about kind of her experience with my sister since her birth and trying to protect my sister and keep her safe and normalize her to society and every kind of activity to build her self esteem. And, you know, she can't do sports, so put her in 4 H. Yeah. You know, take, take care of the horse, learn responsibility. Um, so many, so many things. My mom's life was dominated by it. And your, and your mom's name is when, April, right? Yep, April. April Flosky. So as soon as my sister died, my mom had this huge vacuum. Like she never kept my sister safe. She never mm -hmm. completed that project of getting my sister's life to be normal again. And a lot of that was reacting to her childhood, you know, of not being safe and being neglected and kind of rejected basically um, and sent to the U.S. away from Japan to, to be a foster child with her 12 year old brother when she was nine. Wow. So. Um, so she was really trying to make her family safe. And so that rocked her world. 
so that writing that book was a grieving process and then she just published it so yeah. you know self-published here's the book dolly yeah you can go get it at where's the website ellie you know what the website it is stuff in? it's my sister's name dolly foskey.com d-o-l-l-y and then my last name f-a-u-s-k-e dollyfosky.com so if you get a chance guys uh anyone go check out that book order it and then most importantly leave uh elliot's mother a comment on her website after you've read the book and what you thought and maybe this book has helped you and you know the only reason why i even brought all this up was basically for the book and basically to get your mother's your sister's story out there and keep this healing process going and maybe this could help many other homes uh that have dealt with something similar to this because uh, yeah. you know we deal with it you know left and right every day and it's also you know i'm also leading into a lot of things that have happened to you and because sooner or later we're going to get to a character character you portray and, I, and i'm guessing this is where all the buildup of many things possibly is coming up to this character and uh you know so you know God bless your parents and, 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 you know, for everything they've endured in life and, you know, and to, to stay strong and, and carry on for sure. And uh, so now you've went to school, you tried out for protein, didn't get it. Your sister has passed at this point. Okay. So now what's going through your head professionally at this point? Professionally, huh? Yeah. At that point. I mean, or, or basically what's going on in Elliot Foskey's head. Did you even stop thinking it, about soccer at this point? When my sister passed, I was working construction. I was a laborer. Right. So I was professionally beating the crap out of my body. So you literally quit soccer, period, and just started yeah. working. Well, yeah. So from, from the end of college, I went two years where I didn't really play competitively, maybe a year semi-pro. Um, what happened then? Then I actually went back to college. I had, when I went back to grad school, I had another year of school offered to me. I had been injured, missed a year. So anyways, my coach brought me back, redshirt year. So when I was, I turned 25 during that season. So it was kind of like old man coming back, playing, <laughs> yeah. you know, kind of to bury the hatch in me. My coach had some conflicts. I was like, yeah, let's do this. So. I played for him, so I did play competitively at 25 in college. And then I quit playing soccer for about four years, um, where I played sporadically in a men's league here or there. Kind of kept myself a little fit, but soccer was not in the cards for me anymore. I had a random tryout, you know, how, while I was working. How were you getting these tryouts? I was working construction, and the assistant coach, now the Sounders, he was the head coach of the Sounders then. Somebody hit him up from Chicago and said, hey, we need a player who's not playing pro or college, but he's decent because all our guys don't have documents to go to Canada to play a tournament. So I go up to Vancouver, Canada, and I played really well. I was just working construction, wasn't playing at all, but I was fit from working hard. So I scored a bunch of goals, and it was a Serbian team. And one of these Serbians, he was a part owner of an indoor team in Chicago. So in 2007, they paid me like 500 bucks and flew me out to Chicago just to try out for their team. No, prior to that, sorry, just to play in one men's league game because a Croatian team was playing a Serbian team <clears throat> in the Illinois State Championship. So obviously they had a civil war 20 years prior. This was like, for example, <clears throat> the level of the rivalry, the game got stopped at halftime because fans were fighting in the stands. So they flew me out to play for them. Wow. So I, I played well there. I got a couple assists and we were 2-2 at halftime. So they flew me back out, paid me more money put me up, fed me, let me hang out. Did they have to ask you how your fighting skills were before you came on the team? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't think they were worrying about it because they had some brutish brothers. <laughs> they were getting <laughs> Their main supporter, the main crazy dude was like missing one eye from fighting, you know? Wow. He was a big bad dude. Um, you know, they, they've literally been through the war. And so, we're not you know, talking a lot of money at this point, right? We're not talking like major contracts. Oh, to play soccer? Yeah, major contracts. No, no, I mean... They, they just paid me 500 bucks cash just to take time off of work and construction, just to cover my costs and everything. So I did that. They kept me on for an extra week and I made it down to the final cuts and got let go. So I didn't make the indoor team in 07. Then I went back to construction. Wow, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of re rejection going on. I mean, you know, and again, I'm saying this because like, you are a pro soccer player at this point. So that's why I'm, I'm loving like, you got, you got kicked around quite a bit. Especially yeah. older age. Well, and then I had that head injury. Well, you we'll know. get to that after the break. But, 
We'll yeah, do that ahead. after the break because I'm going <laughs> to say that because that's going to take yeah. a little bit while. But we're going to go on break right now. And, and, and I'm sure Elliot Foskey is going to want to introduce this next song because it's another song from Elliot Foskey. What is it? You don't even know what it is? Well, I mean, I probably know what it is because I did it, but what song are we talking? Moving Under Fire by... Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> I, yeah, I was featured on my buddy's mixtape, Sharp Skills. Sharp uh, Skills. Really talented MC out of Long Beach and Seattle, then back to Long Beach and back to Seattle where he currently resides. Got a lot of respect for him. Now, He's recently written a book. He, he's an active dude, man. Hip hop was before, artist. Was, was this before your your soccer contract or or after? No, no. This was a couple years ago. Okay, okay, um, all right. I, I I was traveling, just having fun, you know, in my off season. Passed through Long Beach. He was like, "Man, you want to get on track?" I was like, "Sure." Met him at his place, and we just wrote it up real quick, and then hopped into the studio the next day. So here is another one of Elliot Foskey's several talents. Again, "Moving Under Fire" by Elliot Foskey. We'll be right back. When the tear drops dry up and your fears no longer scare you Standing on the edge of the cliff, feeling the air move Losing yourself in the present, ready to stretch your wings And all those times in the past that you failed have set you free You are an eagle, no longer bound by the limits Placed on you by the dark surroundings menace Hearts pound as Guinness A new record spinning in your mental stronger senses Make you more alert All the righteousness pounding from the horrid dirt Your cords are sorted turf Flexible performing work The greatest storms of earth You survive the challenge Lost a few branches Garden up revive the damage Some nights you cried in panic As if your life was stranded But now your stands are standing Well planted with the lands erratic Now you running frantic As you pursue your dreams So local with the most Ain't no losing steam I'll never lose my focus Even when the pain is high My body tracked to this earth But my home is in the sky I, I, I'm moving under fire I, I, I'm Still moving under fire I'll never lose my focus Even when the pain is high My body trapped to this earth But my home is in the sky I, I, I'm moving under fire I, I, Still moving under fire The night sky, look in my eyes, I see where you might fly When it's my time to die, hope to die for the cause Bring an honor to my God, fly by the ego My ego will fly me over evil No more judging me by the standards of other people I'm a free bird, fly me home My feet hurt from walking on this earth so long I'm taking off the weight from all the pain and anger Hate and pressure, placed upon us Broken wrongs for the focus on us Human nature's part of the core There's more of a story, glow and fire and rise up I'll never lose my focus even when the pain is high My body trapped in this earth but my home is in the sky I, I, I'm moving under fire I, I, Still moving under fire I'll never lose my focus even when the pain is high My body trapped in this earth but my home is in the sky I, I, I'm moving under fire I, I, Still moving under fire I'm breaking boundaries, free from the bondage Prevalent in the system of thieves that lives the kindness I pay quite a hefty fee for this knowledge On my knees, paying homage, now receiving the promise I can see I've been free, while with fuels My desires I've been used, I've been lied to But cool from the fire I can breathe I can flourish under siege, but I'm a surface Reserve my inner being for the people that deserve it I'm imperfect, but I'm learning that the path I'm on is worth it No diverting from my purpose, no matter how like I know it's work, but it's working I persevere through the personal fears I'm made despite the change It's just how free I can feel I feel no pain I'll never lose my focus Even when the pain is high My body trapped in this earth But my home is in the sky I, uh, I'm moving under fire uh, I, Still moving under fire I'll never lose my focus Even when the pain is high My body trapped in this earth But my home is in the sky I, uh, I'm moving under fire Still moving under fire I'll never lose my focus even when the pain is high My body trapped in this earth but my home is in the sky I, I, I'm moving under fire I, 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 Still moving under fire All right, then we're back And Elliot Foskey Moving under fire. Now, 
What's crazy about that song, Elliot, before we get back into the storyline here, because yeah. just by this song, I've been knowing you for a while now, and we talk music a lot. Why haven't I ever heard that song before? Um, that's weird. I don't know, man. I mean, come on, we discuss plans of music and stuff like many hours <laughs> yeah i don't know speaking of the head injury maybe i just forgot I, uh, <laughs> well i'm gonna forgive you on that i'm gonna forgive you on that because yeah. but i gotta say i really like that track that is an excellent yeah. song excellent song it's worthy yeah. of pushing that's for sure i appreciate that yeah because to me it was like it was an afterthought we you know we talk about doing music together because we've been buddies for a long time yeah. And he's always pushed it. He's done the albums, the mixtape. He's really done some things, you know, and had some stuff placed in TV and movies and whatnot. And for me, it was just always a side hobby, you know, a little local show here and there, getting on a buddy's track. So when I was in Long Beach, you know, I got on this track for the mixtape and it was fun, but I guess I didn't really. I know he was thinking. He was marking, I got this really good looking white guy here <laughs> who's a professional soccer player. I'm going to get him on the track. <laughs> Yeah, he's probably thinking I gotta throw my buddy a bone, man. He's probably wondering when I'm gonna ask him. Yeah, right, right. We we just haven't lived in the same city together, you know. Where's so he? We, in Seattle. We don't, well, he's from Seattle when I knew him, and then he moved back to Long Beach, and that's more like by the time we became closer, he was in Long Beach, and then I was still either in Seattle or Rochester traveling. Gotcha. And then he moved back to Seattle, and I wasn't here, and so this is the first time. Well, I was just traveling, like I said, I was in California, so I was like, man, I'll drive down. See you, say what's up, and we can throw a track together. So. Gotcha. All right, well, we're going to get back to the storyline now. So, all right, you had it. We, we left off. You had a tragedy, your sister. Um, yeah. You went and played for a team. What country was it again? When I. When you. The, the tre- team you, you went and played for in their fight, fights in the stands. What, what country? Well, I was playing in Chicago for a Serbian team. Okay, that was in Chicago for a Serbian yeah, team. Yeah, yeah. Okay. In a, in a Chicago indoor team, one of their owners was Serbian. Okay, that's where I was getting confused. So. Yeah. You, you, that gig only lasts so long. You come back, you got to go back to construction. Yeah, came right back. Just okay. work construction again. So that's 07. You know, had two it, weeks of soccer. Like when you said construction, what were you doing? Like what kind of construction? It, it was labor. So we were building uh, commercial buildings, doing foundation work, shoring. So it was extremely physical. You know, in the mud pits, you're down building walls in the earth. So they dig the hole and we wall it up. So did they you can have, put the did you have previous uh, experience in that field or did they just threw you in? No, man. Learn? If. If you're willing to work hard, you know, they'll take you. So it was a trial basis. So I was, I was actually working in a bank at the time. So, Dude, like I said, I, look, man. What were you doing <laughs> you in a bank? You got to talk. Yeah, not, you not, to the bank? Surprisingly, not trying to rob it. I was actually working there. So, were you cleaning it or a teller or what were you doing? I was a teller, man. So here's how that happened. So I was, <laughs> like, like I said, I had that one year soccer scholarship. My coach called me and said, what are you up to? I said, okay, not much. You know, I was like landscaping for 10 bucks an hour or something. So I said, yeah, I'll, I'll play again. So he gave me four quarters of free school. So I wanted to get into law school, but it was too late. So I got into the MBA program because I could still get in there. So I did the MBA through that season in the fall of 06. And I hated it, you know, but I was like, all right, I'll, I'll keep doing it. It's free school. So I played the soccer season, did the school, dropped out of grad school. I was like, I'm done, man. I'm out of here didn't take my finals I think I think I just walked out on it and so my grades are bad so then everyone was like why are you quitting free education I was like good point so I went in I convinced the school I'm like man this time I mean it you know (laughs) like I don't know what I was thinking I was going through some stuff I'm back went to another quarter got a job at a bank you know wearing a tie every day and just hating my life man I can picture you I can picture you doing construction before I can picture you being a, a bank teller I lasted almost two months. My mom actually, she was visiting Seattle and she's, she goes, come outside with me. I'm like, mom, come on, what are you gonna do? She's like, I wanna take a picture of you in front of that bank sign. I'm like, mom, I'm like why? This is funny. She's like, I know this isn't gonna last. I want proof that this happened. <laughs> so she's documenting your yeah. jobs. <laughs> yeah, within like two, three weeks of that, you know, it was so, like young. So you left the bank, you went back to construction, I'm taking it. No, the first time my, my cousin called me. So I'd done landscaping and some minor construction, but I wasn't in any trade or real right. knowledgeable. My dad's blue collar, so I had done a lot of blue collar work with him, but not skilled. So my cousin called me up, he's like, hey man, this is a construction company, they'll pay you 30 bucks an hour, but they will beat you to shreds. And I'm like, dang, I'm making 12.50 at the bank and I wanna shoot myself anyway. So <laughs> I took up with it and I hadn't been playing soccer, hadn't been running, I'm just sitting, you know, my seasons are, I'm just sitting there in a, as a bank teller 
for a couple months and I'm not very fit and I go and this stuff is so difficult, man. We have these little chipping guns, you know, like handheld jackhammers that you got to hold and be burrowing out these walls so we can, you know, fit these big four toe boards and my hands are cramping up. I, I'm not fit. And I would have got fired, except... Were you still dreaming of soccer, though, at this time? Were you, like, thinking soccer of Soccer was always in the back of my mind, but right. it was always in the back of my mind. It was just a droning frustration. Like, why didn't I take advantage of my opportunities? Why aren't I playing right now? I'm right. in my physical prime. Like, but the motivation... I, I had depression for a lot of years, man. Um, yeah. Like, a handful of years in my mid-upper 20s. And I couldn't shake it. I couldn't get consistently motivated. So I kept myself fit in the hope that one day I would take these opportunities. Because I knew I could still do it. Right. I was confident, but... Were you playing on a, like pickup games at this point? Yeah, or? not not during the construction, not not during that time. You right. know, other than my Chicago team called me, but before and after, yeah, here and there. And yeah. I think you know the story to me is starting to pick up a little bit more now. And to me, it, it really is leading into something because while Elliot took this construction job, he had another major setback, and um, you know. He was working in, what, a ditch or something like that? And a well, I mean, yeah, the foundation, you know, the okay. big pit of the building in Bellevue, Washington, here outside of Seattle, you know, commercial building. And what so happened just, to you in there? Well, there's a concrete hose that, you know, the pump truck is up ground level, and then we're down below. So there's like, I don't know, 100 plus something feet of hose. So there's major pressure pumping concrete through, and I was holding it on my shoulders to pump it into this wall, you know. We, we had drilled horizontally, so, you, you know, dudes have to hold it up, you get it in there. There's this big, long plastic pipe, and as it fills the hole, you back it out. So you're carrying this heavy concrete hose. And so that plugged and exploded, like, instantly. You know, it was one of the first shifts in the morning. It was 7, 7.30 a.m. It exploded, the metal end. So the plastic blew out, and the metal end whipped back, hit my face, and I was lights out for seven hours. I you know, I regained consciousness in the hospital. So it exploded on you in the middle of while you were working, like right next to your face? Yeah, I was holding it. The, the rubber hose, you know, yeah. the concrete hose, and then there was like metal clamps and metal ends that connected them. And that, that end one blew out the plastic that was going into the hole, that exploded, whatever. And that metal piece hit my face, broke three bones in my face. And I I wasn't knocked out flat, like eyes rolled back. Like I walked out of the pit, and but I was just asking the same question over and over for seven hours or something and your like face that. was mangled at this point. Yeah, and I don't remember any of it. So I woke up in the hospital with just my pants covered in dry concrete, no shirt, and I'm laying on a hospital bed, I'm barefoot, you know. So I took my boots and my shirt off, and I, I don't know where I was, and it was like, I think it was my aunt had made it there, and my superintendent. There was like a few people around, and I was asking them questions, like, where am I, what happened? And they're ignoring me, because I had asked that question hundreds of times right. in my concussed state or whatever. Right. And so, finally they, they knew I was too, and explained to me, so that was a, yeah, the broken bones were a deal, but the memory issues that ensued, that was the big setback. So, But you so. had to get reconstructive surgery. Yeah, I got screws and plates all in this face, you know, like over a dozen of little metal shrapnel floating. Right. So, so you, how long did it take to recover at this point? I mean, I never fully recovered, but I, I went back to work in six weeks like a dummy. I thought I was healed. I thought I was fine, but my brain was so incapable of processing the information I thought I wasn't losing memory or anything so my neurologist at my three-month visit was skeptical slash surprised like are you sure you're not experiencing any memory problems and I was like no man I'm cool you know he's like well start paying attention and so as my brain healed I was able to notice things I was forgetting whereas before I was so messed up I didn't even know I was forgetting things and how old were you at this at this point what was your age at this point 27 I think so now you're 27 so you've went through all these things at 20 now you're 27 now what is your mind going through at this point once you get released from the hospital and you're you're you know you said you went back to work but did you go back to work at the same company no oh um, I went back. back to the bank <laughs> nah man I was, <laughs> didn't have the brains for that anymore I um so I went back to a different construction outfit so I went back to them but they weren't busy and I was like, well, I'll just keep myself busy. You know what I mean? They're just keeping me busy pushing a broom in the yard. It's kind of boring. I'll go work for someone else. So for them, that was a dream because then all liability was gone, you know? Right, right. Um, and so six weeks, like, my face was still kind of swollen. I was just dumb about it, man. Like, I, I wasn't there mentally. They were sending me paperwork for my L&I claim, and I wasn't reading it properly. So my claim ended up closing, and I couldn't get care anymore. So I never really got to follow up with the neurologist properly. And um, 
Yeah, it's frustrating, man. I was really bitter for a long time. I was planning, I had plans to kill people and all that, man. I was really bitter because I had friends at the company, and you know they turned my, their back on me because they had liability, and it was bad for them professionally. Right, right. And they felt guilty because really, um, the story went like an 18 year old kid with no experience put the pipes together that morning. You're supposed to let that glue set for 24 hours, and they didn't. And more hoses were popping off that day. They just didn't hit anybody. So I was hot about it, man, when I heard all that. And I just, man, I was bitter. You know, I'm sitting here with a messed up brain that can't think right. And these clowns just, I lived a half mile from that job site and they visited me one time. Wow. You know, there was just lots of friendship. And these are dudes I became real friends with. Like we right. went out together. My cousins have been working there for years. We were all buddies, man. And I, uh, man, I had some dark moments. So how long did the, you know, cause the, the, I mean, obviously the, the, the uh, steel plate, metal plate, and screw stuff, that's bad, but the memory loss is the real issue here. And how yeah. long did that last before you started feeling somewhat normal? I mean, I kind of just think of it in years. Like the first year I healed a ton, the second year I healed quite a bit more, and the third year maybe a little, and then it plateaued. Okay. So, so, so and here's where we're going to start getting to some, some, <laughs> some stuff for your fans because it baffled me you telling me all these things in the past. And now at 27 years, you're 27 at this point. Yeah. Where the heck did soccer come into play and how did it happen? How did you get your foot <coughs> in the door at this moment? Because your sister alone would have prevented most people from ever moving forward in life. Let alone explosions, your face being rejected from teams. You know, there's a lot going on here. I mean, you're 27 years of age. Where does soccer come into play? Um, so after I got injured, you know, I worked for six more months and I was like, I don't want to do this forever, man. The company I loved working for was the one I got injured at. Right. You know, and I didn't want to go back there. I was bitter and plus I'm kind of funny about pressurized equipment now, you know, a little yeah. PTSD. Like, I don't want anything <laughs> pressurized. Maybe you got an aerosol can that's looking like it's a little too tight. You know, <laughs> that's it. Back. You're backing up. Um, just have someone close to you test everything for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe you could stand in front of me, man. Yeah, yeah. that's all. So I... Uh, I take an aerosol I, can for you, buddy. Yeah, appreciate that. <laughs> take concrete hose. <laughs> I won't do that, but I'll take the aerosol yeah. can for you. <laughs> yeah, so I went traveling with a couple friends. Um, well, one friend and then a girl he knew. And just went for one-way tickets, you know? Went around the world. New Zealand, Australia, Malaysia, Singapore, Bali. England, Ireland, whatever, just bouncing all over. And how old are uh, you at this age now? That was just after, six months after I got hurt. So 28. 28, maybe? Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, so still not playing soccer, man. And not active at all, not very fit. I went for a run in Bali, I about died, man. Were you thinking after the accident, though, really in all actuality, were you thinking you were never going to play soccer again? Honestly, I wasn't thinking properly, man. I do Doctors cleared me to play. They said, you can physically play again, you're just at increased risk of head injury. I was like, well, all right, and all my frustration and anger, I was like, F it, I'm not gonna do anything differently. I'm gonna live my life, I'm gonna take my chances. Part of that was a conscious choice, part of that was probably ignorance, you know, invincibility, being injured, not knowing how bad. Um, so I just went back to playing. And not, I didn't go back to competitively playing, but just <clears throat> when I got back games. from traveling, I started pickup games just to blow off some steam. And I guess played for some, buddies who are now my really good friends um you know a few, handful of bosnian dudes a couple of americans a couple dudes from south america you know latin guys were, um, were there people uh, entire time saying you know trying to coerce you into playing soccer and like you need to start picking up things or like because i mean people around this just, just my bo just not just my bosnian friends right he was like man you should be playing pro my one guy who played you know first division france and bosnia he he told me he was like man you know, you should be playing. He's like, you could play first division back in Bosnia. You know, there's a club, it's a hundred year old club in Sarajevo, and he set me up with a tryout. So, so I was playing, what was that, 2010, you know? So I was 28, just about to turn 29. And so he set up everything. I went there for a tryout, played with the B team, you know, did well, the B team coach or whatever, the reserves coach told the head coach, like, yeah, give him a run. So I had to wait for an opportune time because they were playing so many games, they weren't training fully. They were kind of recovery training. So the one week they had a bye, they threw me up there and I got nasty food poisoning, man. And I couldn't keep fluids down. I, could, I would puke, you know, I'm on the toilet. 
20 times a day, I'm just like losing all my fluids. If I tried to rehydrate, I'd vomit. So I played a couple of try, you know, two days I played like that and then I had to go to the hospital because I was depleted. And so I was recovering there in Bosnia. I was like, man, I don't want this. I don't want to live here for 10 months out of the year and just try to push through this. I don't speak the language. So I was living in an apartment by myself. You know, I just got bummed out. I'm like, I'm not going to come back from this. So I just went back to the U.S., took a little vacation in Croatia first and then headed back. And at this point, you still really don't have any plans. You're still just... Man, no career, no plans. I got a Spanish degree, you know, that I got from Seattle U that I never really planned on. I'm an MBA dropout student. So... And I just didn't have any desires to do anything, goals. Um, and I came back, but but I was a little fired up. Like, I was enjoying playing to a degree. But it was a love-hate, man. Like, playing was really fun again, the adrenaline. But then my mind couldn't keep up with the game. So, like, I'd blank out what they call brain freeze, where, like, your eyes are seeing everything fine, but your brain can't process it quickly enough. So you just freeze out. Like, you right. have these blank moments. So that would happen constantly when I was playing, because I had to turn so much. And you know, see the field and bodies moving and the ball and everything. So to regain my equilibrium. So I was coordinated, my timing was fine, my vision was fine, but my decision making would be slow or impaired. And that was so frustrating, man. That would really make me angry. So I just play more physically. So I'm an aging player who should be relying on his brain. So right. I'm seemingly having to rely on my physicality. So I was just mad, you know? And so I kind of wanted to take, it was happenstance. Again, I was playing in a men's league game and my buddy goes yo there's a semi-pro soccer team they're paying 25 bucks a game what it was over an hour from where i was playing and i'm like this is gonna be funny i'm gonna go play for that team and be a pro soccer player i'm gonna get a paycheck and so i went and i signed a little one-page document you know it was like sign here for 25 bucks a game played a little season you know just local so you went in a hole after gas and everything every game heck yes <laughs> way in the hole. i bought a burrito on the way home you know right, right. dipping into savings but no, that was just to be funny, man. Like honestly, it was a joke to me. It was. And, just, I mean, what you really look at, like, look. While a, I, I will st- maintain staying in shape, but I just want to be able to say I'm a pro soccer player. You didn't. No, because I wasn't proud of it. It was like a joke. It was like 25 bucks a game. It was like this is so much less than my dreams or what I had envisioned and what right. I wanted. Right. So it was almost as funny. It was like spoofing yourself. Like can't beat them, join them. Like I, am not a pro. Right. So. I'm going to frame this little one-page document one day or something. Was depression still kicking in at this point, too? Uh, Yeah, heavy, heavy. Worse than ever? Yeah, worse than ever, but luckily my motive... I was motivated to play because it was like blowing off steam. It was my release. So at that point, I was like playing and playing hard. Was that that still indoor soccer or outdoor soccer? That was indoor soccer. Really quick, because I really don't know myself. And I'm I'm sure there's a lot of people don't know. What is the difference between indoor soccer and outdoor soccer like it's a big difference indoor soccer outdoor soccer is 11 v 11 running clock right 45 minutes halftime 45 minutes go back out there you only sub a few players all game once you come off the field you can't go back on at the professional level so it's very endurance based you know it's a very rhythmic building a lot faster right? grinding no slower than indoor grinding 90 minute game indoor is staccato super sprint there's timeouts, there's four quarters. So it's one hour play, and you run in shifts like hockey. And we actually use hockey rinks. We put AstroTurf on the ice. The ball, if it hits the boards, it stays in, you're good. The ball only goes out of bounds if it goes over the boards. And we're, we're changing during the game. So if my partner comes, he's, he's a little tired or he's ready to sub, he runs the boards, I jump on for him. And it's continuous. So it's very high, intense, fast soccer for shorter periods of time. I would so think you, it'd be more taxing on your body indoor soccer than outdoor soccer. In some ways, yeah. In some ways, you can do it till you're an older age. But really, yeah, that turf is tough, man. You know, it, yeah. it can catch up with you. Now, did you now when you were coming out? Did you did you want to be an indoor soccer player all along, or an outdoor soccer player? Or you didn't? No, you I, play? no, I wanted to be an outdoor soccer player. Indoor soccer was never really in my mind, other than that random trout I had in 07. That was just right. like an isolated, strange experience that happened. It was cool. I made a little money to go play soccer. That felt nice. Right. But ultimately, indoor soccer isn't recognized by the world governing body, FIFA. So it's it's a minor league sport, you know. It's not it's not where you want to be. It's a stepping stone, or it's it's a. I think it's an exciting spectator sport. Personally, it's my favorite soccer to watch. Right. Um, but it's not what you want to be playing. The money isn't there. You know right. what I mean? You want to be playing in Europe, overseas, or at least outdoor in the U.S. MLS. Right. 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 So 
no, that was never the plan. It, it's a constellation prize. You know what I mean? Like, it's like I'm 30. So, so from that indoor team, that indoor team also had a semi-pro outdoor team. So I tried out for them and we won the national championship. Well, Wait, what was the team you, you got to make the team before you won the national championship, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, the Kitsap Pumas. It's a PDL team. Okay. So it's a semi-pro team. You know, there's a handful of Canadian teams and then like 60, 65 U.S. teams. So it's a big league. We won it. It was really cool, really fulfilling. I felt very grateful to have had that experience. Paying, what was that paying a day, if you don't mind me asking? 750 bucks a month. So it's a significant jump from... 25 a game <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah i mean you know at least i was making some money at that point right right and but you know it, it's just eking by and coaching on the side right 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 so uh, i did that we won the championship and an agent saw us play and asked me if i want to keep playing so he signed me or he talked to me and i was like yeah but i might go try out in mexico and then that mexico thing fell through and i never followed up with the agent so two months later out of nowhere i'm like studying to get into law school this time, post head injury. So you're thinking about that. I'm done with soccer. Well, I'm like, man, I gotta use my potential. I gotta do something. You know, I've always been a justice advocate in my head and whatever. So I'm like, I'm gonna get into law school. So I'm studying to take the LSAT to get into law school and I'm miserable. I can't focus. I've had this head injury. I don't really wanna be doing it. I don't want the jobs it's gonna give me. So my motivation is garbage. The agent called me. He's like, hey man, there's an indoor tryout in New York. You, you know, you, you still want to play soccer. I was like, sure. So then I was going to study at the same time I was going to train. And all I did was just get in shape and I quit studying. I went and I made the team in New York, man. I went on a tryout and at the tryout, they pushed that contract across the table and I couldn't believe it. Even though it, it was indoor and it wasn't where I had always dreamt of being, like I was completely done. I thought that semi-pro championship, that was like, that was a nice little cherry on top of my, you know, disappointed soccer career. Yeah, right. Um, and that's, yeah. and that's yeah. when you came oh. to the Rochester Lancers. Correct. And, and that was the fall of 2011. I had just turned 30. So at 30 years of age, after going through all of you went through to this point, which is a lot, to finally sit down at 30 years of age and sign a contract doing something you lo absolutely love doing more than anything else. I mean, that's to me, that's that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, it was a uh, very special man. And that was with the Lancers, and you know we're gonna get into a little bit of this because with Sam Fantuzo, yep, who is one of the owners or the owner. Well, he started out as one of six. He was the majority owner, and there was a handful of others for two years. I think it was year three, they jumped ship, and he just put it all on his back, and he was the only owner. I think for two seasons he was, maybe just one. When you went on this interview, did you have your shirt on or shirt off? What interview? When you had soccer for the soccer trial, did you have your shirt on or shirt off? <laughs> <laughs> Man, soccer Sam wouldn't have cared. He's all about height. The coach would have had something to say, but it, yeah. And we're gonna get, and you know, I keep forgetting to tell the the producer, but we're gonna we're gonna take another break. We'll carry on while he's loaded up. And uh, we're going to take another music break, or are we going to take a video break, uh, producer? You let me know while we're talking. But um, there's a lot has happened when you signed this contract with Rochester. It, to me, I don't know if you ever seen this coming or, you know what, if you plan it this way. Um, but when we get back from this, we're going to play a video. Well, let me, let me, before we do this, okay, Elliot Foskey here did a video. And it's called Onesie Nation. Okay? And I want to just get... And producer, bear with me. I want to get into this a little bit. Because Onesie Nation is a phenomenon to me. And I think musicians and all other entertainers can learn something from this video. I really believe this because I have musicians who do drums they're some of the best drummers guitar players singers you know keyboardists some of the best in the world i mean they really are at the top of their game and they put out videos and try to sell records and they have no luck they'll put out a video and it might get a thousand views at best okay now this onesie nation video elliot foskey put together out of the genius of his mind and how he's yeah. gonna promote it. When I Genius. first when I first look at this video, I'm like, I'm just caught off guard. I'm gonna be honest with you, like 
I'm used to a certain seeing a certain thing. Like I like the, you know the rock videos with the w women and all this, and I, I like that. That that's a kind. Of, I like seeing stunts and this and that, right? Elliot and Elliot Foskey does Onesie Nation, and the day he drops it, it blows up. He has done more with this video than most music musicians could ever dream of doing on an independent level. And it made me really wake up to see what's really happening with the YouTube world, the internet world, what they're interested in, to the point where it's got thousands and thousands of views in, a, in the very first few days. And then also, little kids are remixing this video and sharing it with them. So let's take a break here. Here's Onesie Nation, and we want you to comment on this when we come back from, from, from break. Onesie Nation, Elliot Foskey. Yeah, you know what time it is. That's playoff time in the MASL, baby. You can't do it alone, you gotta unify. So that's what we mean when we're saying it's a onesie nation. Uh-huh. Tacoma stars. Once upon a time, a game was on the line It happened in the playoffs, it was double overtime, overtime. The San Diego Sockers came around to take us down I can't believe the season, man, they beat us in our hometown Fans lost their mind, we're on the losing side But with satellites among us, the Tacoma stars will shine Our season isn't over, we still got a chance to win it With onesies and our game face on, we bout to get it Onesie Nation, Onesie Nation We always at war, we don't take vacation Onesie Nation, Onesie Nation, we stand as one, that's our Onesie motivation. Onesie Nation, Onesie Nation, we always have war, we don't take vacation. Onesie Nation, Onesie Nation, we stand as one, that's our Onesie motivation. We don't mess with twosies, we don't mess with groupies. We strictly wear our onesies like the ones you see in movies. We start in onesie wars, use our onesies like a Uzi. Tacoma stars ain't backing down, we hot as a jacuzzi. If you ain't got a onesie, best turn in your resignation. A unified force fighting for a onesie nation. So who's that onesie warrior trying to build the inspiration? That's the Mohican warrior for your information. Onesie nation. Onesie Nation, we always at war, we don't take vacation. Onesie Nation, Onesie Nation, we stand as one, that's our onesie motivation. Onesie Nation, Onesie Nation, we always at war, we don't take vacation. Onesie Nation, Onesie Nation, we stand as one, that's our onesie motivation. Onesie Nation, something sweet, full body cover, fuzzy feet, fight to the last breath, impress the masses, Tacoma stars won't accept defeat. Onesie Nation, where's your one? You should have done this interview in a onesie. Man, it's too warm now. I get, I get throw one of them on, but yeah. But that is, a, that, to me, that video is a great example of people, listen, they want something entertaining. And they, they, you know, a lot of people might look at this video and say, what is this kid doing? And then all of a sudden you see thousands of views on this video and kids loving it. And so I'm going to go back even, you know, before we started the video. Because something happened when you signed this contract with uh, the Rochester Lancers, okay? This pro contract. And somewhere along the line, and because it, it does tie into this video, some came up where this this this, this um, character was created. And you yeah. want to elaborate on this character, what this character is called? And the how Mohican. it's about? The Mohican Warrior. The Mohican Warrior. Now... <laughs> I was thinking, I was thinking it was created from all these things that happened way long ago, and you're like this this warrior. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know, because you've never told me how you created this name. No, it's a complete joke, man. Um, so I've been growing up my hair. I've always done dumb stuff to my hair at random, and this time I had grown my hair out, got bored of it, and just shaved the sides. You know, my roommate's girlfriend shaved the sides in the kitchen one day, so I had this. You know, just hair on top, 
no mullet flowing down the back, no, no hair on the sides. So I would wear it in a ponytail, a short little fountain <clears throat> ponytail. And everywhere I went and played, the opposing team would call me Pebbles. They'd be like <laughs> calling me a chick and making fun of me or whatever. So then I was on a radio show in Rochester and the DJ was, well, you know, Brother Weeze. Yes. And so Brother Weeze was like, you know, this raspy old voice is like, so man, what do you do? Throw that hair up in a ponytail when you play? Kind of flipped me some crap. And I was like, well, actually, yeah. And to make it sound tougher, you know, I was like, well, I like to think of it more as a Mohican warrior look because they used to go into battle with parts of their head shaved and they'd be all wild. And so that was me trying to like salvage, you know, the Pebbles image in Soccer Sam. Fantuzo, our owner, was of course listening into the radio. And when he heard that, it's all over. You know him with this personality. I was <clears throat> labeled the Mohican Warrior. So in, in, so in Soccer Sam was also in the WWE <laughs> wrestling, correct at one point? Yeah, he was in the original WWF in the early 80s. He was Dr. Love. Okay. Chauvin chauvinist, womanizer character, and you loved him or hated him. And his wife was Nurse Nice Lips. <laughs> <laughs> you know. His lovely wife had to put up with him for a lot of years, man. So he so. do marketing. Oh, he's a marketing genius, man. You yes. know him from Salvatore's Pizza and all his does all his own marketing and his his mind is always going for that stuff. So he started calling me the Mohican Warrior. And then, you know, that was even before I mohawked my hair. Right. What had happened was some drunk dude at a bar thought I had a mohawk, stumbled up to me and was like, dude. I used to have a mohawk in high school, man. Yeah, and he was talking about his high school experience with a mohawk, and I just thought he was a drunk weirdo. And then later, I was like, oh, he saw the sides of my head shaved. He thought I wore it in a mohawk sometimes. Right. So I just threw it up in a mohawk for a training, for practice one day, just to mess with my teammates and be funny. Because they didn't know me that well, still first year. They didn't know I was weird, that weird. And so- oh, your roommate knew that. Yeah, I mean, some of the dudes had an idea that was a little odd, but I was like, oh, I was throwing for a loop, you know? So I just had the long spikes and, um, and it was funny, and so I just decided to do it for the game the next day, and I slept in it and just wore it at the game the next day. So spiked out, and everyone at home can see what we're talking about, but you have yeah, a I mean, big, you know, thing sticking out, and everyone that's watching this right now can see it. But you know, that's an amazing thing to me because how this came about, it created this whole nother character, and and I believe the Mohican Warrior also gave you a, a newfound love for marketing inside of the game yeah 100 percent. because um and then like i said the whole thing was an accident even even the character was like i just had the nickname then i had the hair and then you, you played know, soccer at 30 years of age is an accident yeah you know everything yeah yeah it wasn't yeah none of it was planned man looking back it's uh yeah i was very grateful it fell into place like it did and then you know, I was looking at some WWF wrestler. I never watched it that close as a kid. I watched a little bit, but the Ultimate Warrior, you know, he was a nut. He was just, his interviews, he was otherworldly. He was just so off base. So me and my Irish teammate, Gavin, we'd be joking around and imitating this dude. And I'd be going on these diatribes, ranting about the Warriors and indoor soccer. I'd be doing it in practice to be funny. And it's like, you know, you got to give that to Soccer Sam. He's like, you got to give him a halftime interview in character. So I told Soccer Sam, I was like, yeah, man, I've been messing around. I got something for you. Let's put me on the mic at halftime. Because they always interview a player or two as we're exiting the field at halftime. Right. So I just went nutty on it for a second. Do you remember what it was exactly you said? We were playing Syracuse, our rivals. And um, it, it was the clash. It was a medieval clash of the Titans. Because they're the Silver Knights. So they were knights and were the Lancers. So like these medieval armor guys. So Lancer Louis is our dragon. Our mascot is the happy blue dragon. So Lancer Louis was like leading our warriors into battle against the Silver Knights and over the great nation of Rochester. And I don't know, I might've talked about my warrior cave in that one. So like the whole like me living in a warrior cave was born in one of those first two videos. So, so that was live, that was just BS. And then the next week I was like, man, I gotta do it again. Sam wants it again. So Sam, after Sam seen it once, he's like, He's licking his chops, going, man, the kids yeah. are going to love this. This is going to keep kids interested in what we're doing here, right? Well, and he, and he loves it. He's he's interviewing me, and yeah. he's playing around, but he doesn't know what I'm going to say either. So he's, like, loving it. Right. Because it's off the cuff. And um, So you're not rehearsing these? The, 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 yeah, I mean, I, I rehearse them, like, a bit. Like, I get a storyline in my head, but, 
you know, it never comes out the same twice. You're just kind of rolling with it. So now, so. now, now, Soccer Sam is like, do it again. Then after you did that, he's like, do it again. So that was a couple of halftime interviews, and then the season ended. It was like right at the end of the year. Right. That year. So then the next year, um, you know, I sat out most of the year. I was injured. Um, I, I hurt my head again. So I wasn't sure if I was going to play at all. He's like, dude, come back out. I'm going to keep you around. We're going to do this thing. You know, let me know if you can play again. Cool. So he just kept me around. So I was like, okay, I got to go in on this character a little more heavy if he's going to keep me around. So I was announcing our games live for radio and TV with Joe Giuliano, our regular play-by-play -play dude. And we had a ton of fun. And then I started making videos in character videos, talking trash to our opponents is the Mohican warrior just to like, you know, garner a little attention, gives people something to look forward to about the game and whatever. Yeah, and what's so. funny about it is this character you developed, you know, I've seen a lot of your, your videos and I've been to one of your, your, your uh, games. And let me tell you something. These fans go bananas over you and your character. They Our absolutely fans are awesome, man. They love it. And, and to me, you know, there's a lot of negative things going on in Rochester, New York. And one thing I loved about you, forget about soccer, which your character did for the motiv to, to motivate people in Rochester, New York, and the good vibe that it created. It was very special. You really had developed a serious love affair with the city of Rochester. Not just with the Lions, but just you personally developed a, lo a really nice love affair with them. And, and it was funny to me because I think some of the teams, when, when I was at, and, and hopefully nobody gets upset about this, but when I went to one of your games, I was in the back locker room. And I, you got the Mohawk and it was Christmas time. And you have lights on it, Christmas lights <laughs> up on it. And I kind of seen some guys looking funny at you like... This guy's a suck up to the owner or whatever. However, they were looking at you. They weren't. I wasn't seeing 100% respect. And when I went into the crowd and sat in the crowd and you came out, I looked around and I seen every kid just on the edge of their seats. They're throwing things in the in the in the, in the crowd. They want. I mean, they they were so happy to see you and what you did for them. And it made me realize. What those guys were all about so not all those guys just a few of them they were about jealousy because you were actually making the best out of a situation literally you made the best for your team your owner yourself your fans you made the best of a situation for most people when you're injured you ride the bench you know what i mean so to me yeah. you, you really developed a nice love affair with the fan with with a nice fan base here and that's kind of you know a lot of the reason why i was kind of going right from the beginning because a lot of people know but i also want people to realize what one has to go through to get to certain things in life nothing was handed to you nothing was given to you if anything everything was against you more than most and so to go from you know your sister to the, the the accident to rejection in the games you know to not being able to play you're 30 years of age and to make this many people so happy at the end of the day and inspire all these people to me uh you know round of applause i mean that to me sure. is absolutely amazing and a role model is just saying it lightly to be honest with you and i, I, I don't know how you feel about that role model situation if you're good with that or that's what you want to do or is it tough maintaining that or you worry about your image on the outside of that you know what i mean like what goes what, what goes into being a role model there elliot man a lot it's um like i loved my experience with the rochester fans it's crazy like you said that city embraced me like crazy you know from news to radio to the fans and the kids because the Mohawk, obviously the first appeal is for kids. They see, you know, if they don't know who I am, it's spiky, spiky everywhere I go. Yeah. And, you know, if they know my name, it's the Mohican Warrior. But in Rochester, I was in dozens and dozens of schools doing assemblies. And just because of my hairdo, you got the kids' attention and their respect and you can reinforce good values that they might not want to hear from a parent or a teacher all the time. So we would do something called eat right, treat right, talking about eating right, treating their bodies right, being healthy. But the main thing I would try to focus on was not just anti-bullying, but just how to treat people in general and ask them, how do you feel when someone's mean to you? Who's been made fun of? Raise your hand. Does that feel nice? What are some conflict resolution things you can do? And, you know, once in a while, 
and that's off the cuff too like you said I, I do mostly off the cuff I don't really like to plan a lot sometimes I talk about my sister and her struggles and how she was made fun of and rejected and right. you know that resonates with kids and so it was this, this stupid mohawk and a bunch of hairspray was able to give me a serious platform with youth yeah and of course parents appreciate that you know and so it was like this whole and then it's fun too like I'm goofing off at the games and but yet I'm competitive on the field you know I'm trying to tear somebody's head off yeah I would but, think but then I'm goofing around so like you're trying to balance that I would think that'd be strange as an opposing person seeing this guy up in the stands flying around and doing this with his hair and then come on the field and he's complete opposite he's like he's he, he's really a warrior on the field I would try to break his leg, man. I'd be like, what a douche, you know? Like, what are you, that's what the attention getting. And so I have to endure that. I'm a little self-conscious. I, I want to take my sport seriously in my craft and be a competitor. Yeah. But at the minor league sport level, you got to put butts in the seat. So it's a business idea. You know, it, it's good for marketing. It's good for business. It's fun. It's fun for me. It's fun interaction. But then it's actually people on people. Like, it developed a lot of relationships for me. It's not just some shallow, gimmicky thing. Yeah. It's really profound at the same time. So, for me, it was an awesome experience. And as far as a role model, I want to be a role model. I feel yeah. like that's whatever I've been given, I want to do well with and give back. But at the same time, sometimes I feel false, like you said, to protect my image in the sense that so many kids are watching me. They're on Facebook, Instagram, you know, I'm just public. Anybody can. I accept anybody, if, you know, whatever. Yeah. So I don't want to air out my dirty laundry memoir style, you know? So yeah, now I have drank and I have, you know, dabble with drugs and different things. And that's not something I regularly do, but I definitely don't want to put that on social media because of the kids who might yeah. see, I don't want them to think that that's cool and, and to influence their life in that direction. Not that I don't want to talk about it. Sometimes I want to be more vulnerable and be more open with my shortcomings because people see that image and they're like, man, what a role model, what a guy doing all these things in community, this, that, and the other. But when it boils down, it's like, I know how imperfect I am. Yeah. I know that's not the image I fully want portrayed. You know, I want to be a good role model and I want to be genuine. I don't want to be false, but you got to protect, you know, little minds. Well, like, I'll, I'll say this about you, knowing on you on a personal level, if you mess up, okay, no one's going to be harder on you than you. And that, was, that was my depression, man. Yeah, no one's going to say you screwed up and, and, and crucify more than yourself. And I've witnessed it. I've seen when you get, when you do, and, and, and to, funny, to be funny about it, like, you really don't do anything. <laughs> like, I'm trying to make it sound like you, you're going out and you're, you're, you're doing cocaine and getting drunk. Every, you don't do any of that stuff. Like, to me... Consistently, I have done those things. You have tried it, but doesn't mean... Yeah, it's it. never been a lifestyle. Yeah. Right, exactly. Like, for me, I said to myself before tonight's show, I've been doing radio and music for years. Like, this is the first show I've ever done without cussing. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, and I, I you know, when, you, when you're talking, it looks like you're chewing bubble gum, trying to like keep it all in there. <laughs> that's, that's coming out. You're looking for the euphemism. But it's just about respect that I have for you and, and, and the fans that you have. At the end of the day, I don't need to cuss. You know what I mean? And that's yeah. how I figured. But you, you, um, you really walk the walk and talk the talk. Because every time you're concerned about, you know, what, what people may know about you or find out about you, I'm like. Damn, that's like nothing compared to the things I've seen people doing, you know, this and this and that. So to me, um, it really is, and I, you're not one to preach to people. That's what I love about you too is because to me, there's nothing more annoying than some person coming up and preaching all kinds of crap to you. You, If people ask you, you're happy to tell them about certain things, but you're not walking around flyer saying this is how you got to live your life and this is how you should be. And that's a great way to get people to, to, to hear your message because your message is pretty pretty amazing. You know what I mean? So, And I'm not even sure if you're aware of your message at this point, but me knowing you as, as many times, you know, speaking to you as many times I have, I, you got a, a pretty incredible message. Like, I have no problem with you bringing you anywhere, buddy. <laughs> you know, not at all. And um, especially being in the entertainment business, I'm not always happy, uh, proud to bring certain people around. You know what I mean? So... Uh, and it, watching you at the stadiums, my I brought my godson to the game, and how you interacted with him, and you know he's still talking about it. It was what two years ago, you know what I mean, or something like that. It was a few years yeah. ago, so it's pretty amazing. But the biggest point that I love the most is you made the best 
out of every situation you were put into. Um, you know, you didn't give up on your dreams. You might have stopped thinking about it for a while, but other things came up. But I think the reason why these opportunities were coming because of the respect that you've developed over the years with people. And I think how else is an opportunity like this come? You know what I mean? How, how else does it happen? It doesn't happen by mistake, you know? Yeah, I mean, like I said, it was always in the back of my mind because I was so frustrated that I never played. And then I would get flashes of, man, maybe I'll get the motivation again to do it. Yeah. And that's why I tried out in 2007 and 2010. You know, when I had the opportunities, when they presented themselves, I didn't yeah. go looking for it, but I was, I tried to jump on it. I wasn't prepared in 07, so I was just working construction. I wasn't playing at all. But you had an um, agent too, though, right? No, not at that point. No. That was, that was the random opportunity through the men's league with Serbians. And then in 2010, I still didn't have an agent when I went to Bosnia. My buddy just knew people who got me into the camp, you know, <clears throat> trying out with the team of Sarajevo. And I was more prepared then. I was more fit then, you know. Like I said, I got sick and just didn't want to be there, and I just bugged out. Um, so there are other clubs I could have stayed and tried out for, too, in Croatia as well. I had contacts there. But um, I always, in the back of my mind, I want to stay within three weeks of game fitness. That was always my thing. I was like... No matter what I'm doing in my life, I want to be three weeks away from being able to play competitively. Yeah. How do you handle it when you're like out and about? <laughs> Say you know you're in Rochester and you go to the local restaurant <laughs> for breakfast, you know, lunch or dinner. Are people coming up to you and does that annoy you when you're in the middle of something? Say you're on a date or whatever. Say you're in a meeting and you're eating out. Are people walking up to you and saying, "Yo, that's that's not," or they don't notice you because your hair is not up? The chances of me being on a date and someone recognizing me at the same time. <laughs> so, so right, just out to breakfast with your friends. Yeah, I mean, I in Rochester, I got recognized quite a bit towards the end because yeah. at first, the, the main notoriety outside of the soccer fans I got was for the Mohawk. So without the Mohawk, I'm anonymous, you know. But by the end, by my last year there, people had seen me on the news with or without the Mohawk. They'd seen enough of with and without that yeah. they could recognize me. So it started happening a lot more. And um, here in Seattle, it's a lot bigger demographic. I've only played here one year. Um, our following isn't as big as it was in Rochester either. So I'm more of a drop in the bucket. We have all the major league sports here pretty much. And Rochester, it's all minor league, you know, so you're revered more and it's more geared towards that. But, the, but, um, you wanna, but I would think most- but I love it. I, right. I, I, I love it, man. I'm not burned out on it, of right. course. It can be inconvenient, but it's humbling. Like at the end of the day, if you can make someone's day by talking to them or signing an autograph, because I know when I was young what that meant to me. Yeah. And and I look back and it was like, not you know people who were not famous, not even getting paid to play. There's a semi-pro team, and I was in junior high. I was their ball boy. You know, five years later, I played for that semi-pro team in Spokane. You know, but at the time, I was getting their autographs, and they were larger than life. And then a lot of those guys ended up being my teammates later. Are there, but, are there a lot of these soccer moms coming up to you, Elliot? And like, they're not even thinking about the war. You're thinking about Elliot Fosky. I mean, does that happen quite a bit? I mean, what's quite a bit? I mean, I mean you know, I'm just kidding. Um, a bunch it, of times it, during the season. <laughs> I mean, it's not overt. You know, you sense that sometimes. Right. Uh, you know, there's a. Look, man, women, are, if they're single, they're looking for a dad for their kids. They're like, oh, he's good with kids. <laughs> they, they look at their imagination, and I'm like, man, I'm, I'm, so, just, I'm so far from being a parent. You don't want me. Yeah, you know? right. I just find it hard to believe a lot of these guys in the league, I would think any pro sport that you're, you're playing with, I would think you'd want to be more marketable and not just a player. I would think that you would have the motivation to want to do all kinds of things within that business. Like, do you believe, because I, I believe even though the Mohawk helped you, you still would have done something. You would have had a role other than just playing soccer with this team. Well, it, it already was. You know, just the haircut alone without the Mohawk was distinct enough. Because in the fans, you can't always tell everybody apart. But I had the shave size and the ponytail, so you at least knew who I was. And my style of play was just real aggressive, you know, just always hassling people up and down the field. So it was... It was eye-catching already. Um, but yeah, I was, I grew into it, man. I got more and more comfortable speaking in front of people, doing assemblies for kids and finding kind of my voice and what I wanted to do with it. Instead of like, here's a team appearance, shoot, don't blow it. You know, I hope I'm yeah. not boring. To being like, this is an amazing opportunity. 
So I was already doing that before the hair came into play. Well, um, even, even before you, you know, I think it was the end of last season, not the season just went by, but the season before, the end of that season, you went off to Africa. Yeah. And you were teaching soccer over there. I mean, give us a little story about that. what happened. Yeah, 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 that was random too, man. Yeah. Uh, I, I love random saying, like, stuff. People don't understand, like, I just don't think things are falling in your lap. I think you're just unaware of how hard you've been working and what you've been doing that are opening up these doors for you because it's, this isn't normal stuff, Elliot. It's calculated random. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I try to put myself in positions to be, you know, you want to be prepared that if something happened, you could do it. Yeah. So that's why I never wanted to totally lose my fitness because I'm, I always knew there was random soccer tryouts available. So even though I wasn't pursuing it, I knew anything could happen. Yeah. Um, for example, so yeah, I went to Africa because you know hurt my one head again. One way ticket, by the way. One way ticket. He calls me, and tells me I'm going to Africa. I just better buy a one way ticket. I don't know what I'm gonna do. Yeah, was that man? That was just last summer. Last summer. Was it last summer or the summer before last? No, it was just last summer. Okay, last summer. Now my memory's gone. Never mind. I wasn't. <laughs> I, I was not hurt. I right. I just wanted to do it. That's right. Okay. Right. So I just left. Bought a one way ticket. And I didn't know where to start. I knew I wanted to see something in Africa. So I just called friends of family, just looking for contacts. So a good friend of the family, kids I grew up with in the neighborhood, they had seven daughters in a row and then two boys. They're like our playmates all growing up. Their aunt helped found an organization that puts thousands, I think it's 7,000 at a time. Kids, they pay for their school fees, housing, feed them, everything out of real rough situations in Uganda. So. This is a reunion camp because they mostly do grade school to junior high. So they brought the high schoolers back. So they go through the school through junior high. Then they go back to where they're from. And they continue to provide for their school fees because there they don't get free education. Public school comes with school fees. So that's a real privilege to even get to go to public school. Yeah. And, and so it's a high school reunion. So she just said, you got to come check out our new campus. You know, they got new buildings and... And by our standards, they're not extravagant by any means. But for them, this compound is amazing. You know, it has kids going to grade schoolers going to school there, living there. So these high schoolers converge, and I was, you know, trying to kind of coach these kids. But for the most part, they just want to play. They haven't played organized sports. A lot of them are barefoot or they're sharing shoes. You know, if I got a pair of shoes, you get one, I get one. And they're running around, playing their guts out, loving Kicking it. Kicking an old ball. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the school provided some decent balls. You know, they're lucky if they get a ball. It's very rare. So, um, him and I went and stayed with him, and he has a few young African guys who go around to villages and refugee camps and just kind of you know, do humanitarian work and try to help out and, you know, they share their faith and stuff. So I just bought dozens of soccer balls in the Capitol and just had them deflated, just had, you know, a big Santa sack, brought it up there and rode a bus up there. It was a nine hour bus ride, just eating dust, man. You know, chicken pooped on my backpack on the bus and, you know, the <laughs> so whole So you ride night. with the chickens in the back of the truck? Nah, it was, it was a bus, man. They just bring them along. Wow. And, uh, you know, it's just different. You're buying food out the windows from vendors. They're holding up fresh cooked corn or meat, you know, skewered meat just off of an open barbecue. So you're just buying. I'm like, I'll take that one. You know, I'm overpaying because I'm foreign. You know, they're giving me the high price. And I'm asking people on the bus, what should I be paying? What should I pay for this? So it was cool. And then I went up north and that was um, cool but hard because the Sudanese refugees, they're, their country, they've been at war for ages and now they've got humanitarian aid from the UN and they're just on welfare, international welfare indefinitely. So these kids have been raised in that, so they don't really have a home. Right. And they can't really go back to whatever home is because they're still fighting, but they're not accepted in Uganda and they can't get work permits. So they gotta stay on the refugee camps. And they're, you know, they have a lot of tribalism. So they're violent within each other. You know, these little kids are fist fighting during our games. Right. I'm just dropping a ball and, you know, they're playing and they have teams. They'll form teams and leagues within the refugee camp, take a lot of pride in it. And if they can get any kind of jersey matching, that'd be a miracle. They don't even get that. Most of them can't even play sho with shoes. So, um, yeah, it was just a wild experience, man. So I was doing that. Did you meet somebody while you were down there too that? Well, well, that's where the more coaching came in was 
on the internet, uh, an old buddy, old friend of the family saw me on the internet. We hadn't seen each other in at least 15, 20 years. And he said, yo man, if you're ever in Kenya, look up my soccer school. Well, I wasn't planning on going to Kenya until an owner in our indoor league of Detroit, Dominic Sekluna, he had recruited Africans before to come to colleges in the US. So he had Nigerians in Kenya trying out to come to the US because this dude from Detroit has an African contact who he trusts in Kenya. So he told the Nigerians, if you want to impress me, you got to impress the dude in Kenya. So the Nigerians jumped to Kenya and they're trying out and he asked me, can you go there? So then I go to Kenya to help evaluate players <laughs> wow. to come to the U.S. to play indoor soccer for our rivals, Detroit, you know? So right. I'm recruiting for the enemy, but whatever. We're friends, you know? So I'm evaluating guys there. And that's when, sort of jump back, my old American friend of the family said, hey, if you're ever in Kenya, go check my school out. I was like three hours from there. So then I went after evaluating those guys the Nigerians in Kenya, along with some Kenyan soccer players. Then I went and did a couple of days of coaching for a mentoring program. They use soccer to keep kids out of trouble. You so know, how you I, were, when you were giving these lessons, the trade-off was you teach our kids soccer, we'll give you a place to stay for free and food. And that's what you were doing it for, basically. That yeah. That was compensation. Yeah, but you that, didn't done it regardless, but. that didn't always happen. You right. know, by the end, I, you know, I was just paying my own way. Right. Uh, by our standards, the, you know, it's cheaper to stay, it's cheaper to eat, and, right. and their resources are limited. So, um, in Kenya, I accepted a little bit of help. But from then on, it was, you know, Africa can be, it, it can be hard to get the details right. And there's miscommunications, and the guy showed up without enough money. And out of the money they were supposed to bring and pay those dudes, they were going to cover my hotel. So I was like, ah, don't worry about it, you know. Like, well, I remember you were calling me one time. You were kind of, not really nervous, but you were like, look, I'm in the middle of nowhere. I don't have cell phone access, I don't have Wi-Fi access, like if something happened to me, nobody would ever know for a while. Yeah. And then you were giving me stories about not much electricity there, only at nighttime. Well, yeah, we, yeah, in the north of Uganda, there was um, generator power, like they had just gotten a solar panel. Right. Put in like the year before that year, up till then, they didn't even have, so they would cool their fridge down like part of the day and just leave it closed. And no hot water, no running water, you know, taking showers, just cupfuls of water out of a bucket. And we're talking hot, dusty, man. And, and it wasn't even the hot season, dude. Yeah, you were telling like, me. Hot and dusty, and that wasn't even their dry season yet. I was, was, you were man. telling me they wanted to give you a net to sleep with, and you're like, nah, I don't need no net. And then the. the yeah, and then I needed the net. <laughs> I needed the net, dude. Yeah. No, oh man, the mosquitoes are getting me. The second deal light goes on, that's where all the bugs go. And that's right where you were, right? Man, yeah. So I, it, it wasn't always really bad, you know? Um, but there were times where if you didn't have a bug net, man, I, I don't know how you could sleep. In your ears, just bugging you, you know? You just want to punch somebody, but they're so tiny. There's no <laughs> satisfaction, like, ah, squashed a bug. You know, I think, and then there's a hundred more, a big deal. Like, <laughs> driving me crazy, man. So that experience had to be pretty eye-opening for you as far as, you know, realizing, well, a couple things, how, how bad off people are in life. You know, how 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 good we have it over here. I mean, you had to come to that conclusion at some point. Like, man, I'm really, no matter what happens to me, I'm, I'm lucky to be who I am and where I'm at. Yeah, it, there's a target on your head when you're over there and you're foreign, you know, yeah. especially being white, because you're immediately different. Yeah. And immediately, you're a billionaire, a billionaire by their standards, and it's yeah. true. You can be like, oh, I'm not rich. You are, I am, you know. If you have a thousand you, bucks in the bank, you're rich. Man, you're beyond rich. It's crazy. They don't have running water. A lot of people, they don't, most don't have hot water. If you have electricity, if you're that lucky, the whole power grid can shut down for days at a time, unannounced. If you have a business, I know a kid, he's got a hair salon, no business that week, no power, nothing wow. we can do about it. Wow. Um, and, and that's privileged people. You know what I mean? That's not talking about the mud huts, whole families sleeping in one little eight by eight mud hut you know, barely eaten, let alone medical, school, any of that. And um, so when they see you, man, if you can panhandle a tourist, get a few bucks, that's better than working for a week. So you can't leave your so, bag down when you go out. You got to bring everything that you have with you, with you. Yeah, well, 
here and there, you know, when there's money to be made, they'll protect tourists like anywhere if you're in a touristy area. But yeah, there are places where it was up for grabs, man. I would keep my cell phone with me because that was my access to the internet and that was my main thing, right. you know, a passport if I had to. But I left my bag and a lot of people are trustworthy and they're not taking advantage. But if you're in the cities where they have experience with tourists, you're smoked. You know, you, you are hunted. Everyone's, you know, begging, lying, hustling, and you don't know who to help. And yeah. You can help people, but you can't help everybody. So you're constantly having to decide, do I turn this person away who's in need? Do I help this one? And so it's very taxing emotionally. Wow. But if you get outside of the city, they're like, sit down, come to my home, have this cup of tea. They don't have anything, man. Like dirt floors, nothing. And they're treating you like royalty. I went to this village, brought a soccer ball and was playing with their team there. Cause they, they like try to have a team. You know, it's just men from a village. It's like no shirts. No it's shoes, like you, no you shirts. Know. Yeah, man, I love it. You know, <laughs> I need a little more sunscreen than they did. Yeah, but why do you even say, "Would you, would you like to marry my daughter?" <laughs> no, nah, man, no. Nah, my didn't daughter that. home with you. No, but some of those girls are definitely, you know, it's an opportunity, man. Yeah, you know? sure, sure. And um, yeah, so yeah, it was it was tough all around, man. Because you're a target, you want to help, but then. You, you know, I, I joke, I'm like, I finally figured out what it felt like to be a hot chick. And like, I felt bad for any girl I'd ever hit on because right. it's like, you know, if you're a hot chick, you go around and I, I need to know where something is in the store. It's like, oh, excuse me, you know, past three people to get to the hot chick. Do you know where milk is? You know? Yeah, right, right. You know, hot girls are always hassled their whole life. And I felt like that in Africa where, you know, people are opportunistic and I would be the same way, I'm sure, in their yeah. position. Yeah. But, it, but it's tough. They're always angling and so people will be so genuine and loving and then ask you for something and then someone will be genuine and loving and not ask you for something or maybe they are genuine and care about you but then they really are in need yeah you no know? and yeah. it's and who do you know and which story do you believe so that was tough 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 on me man i actually got really burned out um you know part way through my trip with that but so so you know going there now you're coming back you're coming back to the States. You were gone for what, a month? Ma you were gone longer? Three than months. You were I, was in, I was in Africa three months. I was in Spain like a week before that. When you got back from your, your, your trip from Africa, Africa, you went back to the team. The team, I think. Team folded. Did, you, did, did you play that season and then at the end of that after, season? Yeah, after Africa, the, the Lancers folded, folded maybe while I was in Africa. Right. So, so maybe before I, I forget the timing. I think I was in Africa when the team announced it was folding. And what was crazy about that team folding to me is they were leading the league in attendance. They were the only, I think maybe one. By a long shot. Yeah, one of the only. What was the average attendance every home game? Our last year was average seven thousand. I mean that's pretty amazing. A couple times we got over ten. So for. Yeah. That league, minor league sports, that's popping. That's really good. And they were turning a profit every year. And the owner, and, and I give it all the they, they They were break even, you know what I mean? Like, right. Which is really hard to do in sports. Right. But the owner, Soccer Sam, Sam Fantuzo, he really had something special going on here. And he put his heart and soul into it. And um, he was absolutely heartbroken when the league fell apart yeah it um the insurance was funny there's a lot of details whatever the money and the time and the headache just didn't make sense anymore to him yeah. you know he loved it he's sick about losing the team he was like you said heart and soul passion the most dedicated he still calls me and protects me with ideas to give to my team yeah marketing ideas you know and that's 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 amazing too because mostly he cared about the people more than he cared about anything else yeah the people and the product to give them is yeah. very important to him yeah for sure he's a, he's a relationship guy he's a community guy you know family guy old italian you know his parents were immigrants so he likes that big italian family all yeah. included you know what i mean so so let me ask you this then what what's next for elliot foskey because the, the, you know this contract that you signed that you love you really love playing here in Rochester. What's next? What's next for Elliot Foskey? You well, can still that, be the I, warrior, or you, what, what are you gonna do? Well, I came home. You know, the Lancers folded, and I got offered a contract to play 
in Tacoma, which is outside of Seattle. Right. And I was born and raised in Seattle. All my relatives are here, except for my immediate family. Um, so I played one season here. I signed a one-year contract. I'm always year-to-year, -year, man. I don't plan too far out. I like leaving room for spontaneity. Um, I, I don't know what the future holds. You know, I'm planning on continuing to play indoor uh, for the time being. You know, Is it so, more taxing now on your body than it was at 30? I mean, are you still... Oh, yeah. Night and day. Yeah. Every year just takes more effort to stay feeling good. You know, more ice baths, paying for more sports massages, doing more stretching, more muscle balancing, strengthening exercises, you know, just keeping it right, man. You, you, ever, see yourself, you ever see yourself coaching a professional team at some point in your, in your life, in your career? Maybe indoor. Maybe an indoor team. I, I have no desire at this point. But like I said, I don't plan anything. Stranger things have happened. But at this point, I could see myself being interested in maybe coaching an indoor team because I love the game. I love right. the sport. And I don't have a lot of confidence in my ability. I've been in the league five years, but I always second guess myself and tend to look at other people like they have more knowledge than me. But I'm confident I could do it. You know, if you have the right people around you, there's things I hate to do, which the administrative portion, I don't like the paperwork and the details and the endless emails and meetings and insurance and blah, blah, blah. Right. So if I had a together front office and I could just be the coach, I, I think I could see that happen. But you end up wearing a lot of hats. Like here in Tacoma, our coach is our GM as well. And that man is so busy. You know, it's... When you say then, insurance, but you have to... Does the team supply you with health insurance? You have to have your own health insurance coming in. It, it, it's foggy. It's um, well, I keep my own personal health insurance always. I just pay private. I just want that right. Um, peace of mind with the team. Technically, it's like any job. I believe you know if you get hurt on the job, they have to cover it. But to save money, they you know they sign you as an independent contractor now. You know, so there's different because they like Sam. He couldn't keep the cost down anymore. Insurance in New York was nutty. You know, they're just jabbing. Well, that's heavily. a big reason why they folded. Correct. It is the principal reason. Right. Yeah. Couldn't keep up with the cost of the inflating uh, insurance. Yeah, man. It was going to be over three hundred grand in a year, just be before you pay a single person of your staff, team, anything. That's crazy to it me. It was over a quarter of a million. That's, that's going into it. Yeah, that's insane and to me. It's like, how can you just go lose that kind of money for a hobby that yeah. takes up a lot of your time and a lot of energy? Yeah, you know? yeah. So I mean, what I mean. You know, at right now you're 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 you just finished the season. You went into the playoffs. You, you guys yes. lost in the playoffs. Correct. And now you're coaching soccer. Correct. Yeah, we got team housing through the end of this month, so I just booked a lot of coaching. Right. Um, just to try to save as much money as I can before I decide to travel again or whatever. Um, whether it's outside the country or in the U.S., you know, I'm gonna pop to Rochester, man, and see yeah. all you guys and catch up. I got to do that. You come and I like back. that. Well, for an extended visit, you know, a little more than a vacation. Do a job at all those pizza stores and said, you know, I want you to be, the, I want you to go around to our pizza stores and promoting them. <laughs> I can do a slice pizza with my hair, like <laughs> sure, I mean, spin it on the top of your head, you know. I don't know. I I'm mean, that guy just loves you. That's why I just yeah, at some if point, it's, if it's like, fun, I would love to do marketing with him, man. We have a ton of fun together, yeah. and his ideas are nutty. And I, I'm my own little creative vein, you know. He's. He's brainstorming like a million miles a minute. You know, he's an insomniac practically because his brain won't shut off and he's got so many ideas, it darn near keeps him awake all the time. Yeah, yeah. And, and for me, I have a little different flavor, a little different vein, but it complements him well, you know? And yeah. so he likes my stuff and I'm just floored by the stuff he comes up with, you know? His marketing I, cracks me up every time. I'm really looking forward to, to be honest with you, with you, because I really don't know what to expect from you. I'm not sure what you're going to do, but I'm sure of one thing. It is going to be very exciting. You're going to be doing something that I would have never thought of in a million years that you would have ever be doing, and I'm going to see you doing it. I don't know what it is. I don't know. You could be a pilot of a plane. I don't know what you're going to be, what you're going to do with, with you know. I don't know either, so if you hear something, I, mean, you, but I know, know it's going to be something special. That's, that's for sure because you do have the power of influence. There's no question about it, no denying it. Um... You know, you're very good at what you do and everything you do um, because you put a lot of effort into it. And that's one thing that I really appreciated. I was really sad when you when you left Rochester and it wasn't because of, you know, I'm never going to see you again. Because I remember you come over to say goodbye to me. I was like, 
man, get out of here. We're going to see each other again. I was more sad that the people of Rochester are going to miss you. That's kind of, to be honest with you, that's what really kind of bummed me out. I was like, you know, these people really love this kid. And to me, um, you know, I'm sure me and everyone else in Rochester, like I even, I still follow your social media and they're going, still going crazy. We miss you. We love, it's like, almost like you're still here. That's how much of a positive influence you had on people. So, you know, I know that that positive influence just doesn't lie in soccer. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, yeah, I was so sad to leave, man. And not for my own sake, because I like change. I was excited for a change, to be honest. I'd been to Rochester four seasons in a row. And again, I only come for half the year, right? I only come play half the year, then I leave. So I wasn't there year round. But it was special. It was like, the boys are back in town. Here they come. We would converse from all over the world. Nearly half our team was from foreign countries. And in another quarter is out of state, you know, a handful of local guys. So it was always like, here we come for the season, then we're gone. And it was this fun, like, reuniting and then until next time feeling. And this time it was permanent, you know? And it was really, it is sad for the people there who, especially the kids, were so invested. We had such dedicated fans. And like you had mentioned, it's not, it's not just the sport. It's not like, oh, now we yeah. can't watch soccer. It was only 10 home games a year. You yeah. know what I mean? It wasn't, like, dominating their life in that sense. But it was so many appearances, so many hangouts. I mean, people would bring us food to our house. Yeah. Or... Make us spend more time in schools than you did the field, really. Yeah, it was it was really special, you yeah. know. And so and enjoyed it. Nobody had a gun to you saying you have to do this. It's not in your contract saying you have to make so many appearances. This is something you really wanted to do. Yeah, it was it was fulfilling. I was grateful for the opportunity. And so yeah, for the people, man, I feel really bad that that team isn't there because they did have a unifying element you know in the community now you said so. you signed a one-year contract with the, the team you play with this this last last season are yeah. you going back to them are you going somewhere else or you can't you not decided yet or contract uh, i mean I, I talked to the coach he'd like me back i told him that was my plan but you know until pens the paper i don't count my chicks before they hatch right um he's got to get the budget from our owner and then he's going to start contacting players he said that would happen the eighth so what's that Sometime tomorrow. this weekend. Tomorrow. That's tomorrow. Yeah. I live in the bubble. <laughs> now, now when you get these contracts going and stuff, you have a you have an agent, or is this just strictly you? I have an agent. So he gets, does he get a cut, a big cut of it? Nah, man, my agent's cool. He's not doing it for the money. Right. <laughs> the money he makes on me, man. He, he's an attorney and he has his own law firm. The money he gets for an hour of work. Man, the hours he has to put in for me, I owe him a lot more. <laughs> he, he, um, he's a good dude. He represents me to the fullest because he's a mentor. I would think, though, I would think a lot of teams would probably be coming at you just for your marketing capabilities alone. I would think that there's, uh, you know, other teams in the league. Maybe they're not coming out, but they definitely have to have their eye on you, I would think. I've had teams reach out to me, but... I missed my last year in Rochester. I missed almost a whole year from a head injury. Mm -hmm. People hear that and they get skittish, you know. Um, I know some teams have mentioned that. They weren't interested because of that. That's an injury that you can't really measure, you know, whether you're back from or not. Right. So I scared people off, you know. I was thankful that Tacoma took a chance on me. And um, yeah, it is what it is, man. So we'll uh, know in the next couple of days whether you're playing Tacoma somewhere else or retiring or what, what, what not. Yeah, yeah, right. I, I know it's short order. I mean, that's. Uh, I mean, to me, uh, I like I said, I would think there'd be like a bidding war minus the head injuries, just the marketing capabilities. I would think, especially on this level, I mean, you bring a lot of value to any franchise you go to, and I'm not even talking about your soccer playing. That's just a, that to me, that's a bonus. The value you bring you bring to a franchise. Yeah, it, it hasn't. I, I know a lot of owners get a kick out of it. And, um, you know, as long as I was at Rochester, Rochester talked about folding and two teams had reached out to me in that interim. Wow. The, the year before they actually folded. So, but I had come off my best year, you know. Yeah. I, I played really well. And so there was interest. But yeah, Pest on the field. That's what you are. You're a pest. Yeah, man. I tell my <laughs> kids I coach. I'm like, you want to make this dude's life miserable. You know, like your job is to... Make him miserable, man. You're always there. Get Dude, in his way. Get, get in his head. Get him paranoid. Like every time he's about to touch that ball, man, he doesn't know where you are. Yeah, I just see you. I, to be honest with you, I don't know, you know, professionally speaking, I just know whatever you do, 
you're always going to be traveling. I just don't see you sitting still for long. At least not yeah. at this moment in life, anyhow, you know? Yeah, I haven't signed a lease in years. <laughs> I, try, <laughs> I try to stay mobile, man. You know, I pop into team housing, and then I'm kind of couch surfing, traveling, something. I mean, uh, listen, I, I, I wish I could do it. I really do. I wish I could, uh, you know, have your physique, your looks, your age, your youth, and go do all these wonderful things and, and go follow your dreams and your goals and your life. You know what I mean? That's what it's all about. You know, so, uh, well, I mean, at the end of the day, like I said, the main reason, you know, getting you on here today is I, I want people to, to recognize what one would go through to get to a certain point in life. Like, you know, I think a lot of being in the entertainment business that I'm in, a lot of times over the years, they see people at the top and they think that they just walk there and they don't realize a story that goes along with getting there. And, it, you know, you're a perfect example of what when one would have to go through to get to certain things in life and accomplish certain goals. And, you know, to me, the rest is up to you. I mean, you just apply that same thing to whatever else you want to do. And but voila, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe strongly in guidance, too. I feel yeah. like my life has been guided. Yeah. And um so I don't feel like I can take a lot of credit for it. I just try to remain open and tap into what is already set for you in a way. Is, yeah. So I think most people have desires in them and dreams and goals, and they weren't put there by themselves. Yeah. I, I really believe since I was a kid, since before I had any intellectual conceptualization or whatever, I couldn't picture anything beyond being a kid, but I always felt like I was going to be in front of audiences speaking. And I wanted to be a pro athlete that used that for something positive because I would see inspirational pro athletes yeah. doing a lot of giving back. And I wanted that as a kid and I believed I could do it, which is weird because I was ignorant. I didn't know what it took. I didn't know. I was just confident I could be a pro athlete. I knew I could be one. Yeah. But like I said, I wanted to be a pro baseball and football player. You know, I'm not big enough to be a kicker in football these days. <laughs> you know? But I mean, listen, like, at the end of the day, I wanted to be a professional baseball player. Really. I, I don't know if yeah. I can tell you, but I wanted to be a professional. Uh, I was very good as a kid. And that's one thing I can always kick myself in the butt for is never really taking that next step or never really applying myself the way I really thought I was capable. But I also, my parents weren't ones to say, yeah, go after it. My friends were, you know, all my friends were getting high back in, back, back in the woods. You know, I was playing baseball. And so I didn't really have people to push me and motivate me. But I always think about it to this day, man. I, I would have been a good boss because I was very, very competitive, you know, just like yourself. I'm still very competitive. I don't like to lose at anything. I don't care if it's, you know, uh, walking to the store. I want to beat the person. I want to be the first person in the door. You know, yeah, we should get together and walk to the store sometime. <laughs> <laughs> play some tennis. That's what I'll do. I'll play you in some tennis. I'll beat you in tennis. <laughs> okay. I've heard that before. <laughs> Are you decent at tennis? I'm not bad. The, the producer, <laughs> the producer that is producing the show is a very good tennis player played in college. He and, might beat me. And I, I took it to him. Might. I took it might. to him. I took it to him, but I will say this. Can I say his name? Who? He like anonymous? Cyber? Cyber yeah. Narcotics? Cyber, dude. You can't let this dude, Mike, beat you at tennis because <laughs> I know I can beat you then. Yeah, but no, no listen. Now, but you didn't let me finish. Okay. I was beating him. He Crazy hasn't played in many, many years at this point, right? Okay. But the only reason why I can say I beat him is because he just started getting fired up and we stopped playing. Now, if this game went on another hour, I wouldn't have even scored another point because he just started getting a serve on and his serve was like a professional serve that you see on, on television. So I won't say, I just say I beat him. I dominated him in the very beginning. Don't play him again, dude. Yeah. Tired. <laughs> but he wound up spanking me at the end of the day. <laughs> but I'll play you in tennis, Elliot. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll beat you that. I don't care. I'm, I'm less competitive the older I get, but there are certain things I do not want to lose at. And racket sports is one of them. That's I, right, I've bro. Done, I haven't done them a lot, but I'm naturally decent, and I hate losing it. Ping pong, pickleball, tennis, anything. I hard, <laughs> hardly play it, but man. Well, when you come back into Rochester, because we're going to have to get going here. When you come back into Rochester, if you have a racket, uh, a tennis racket, or if you have uh, a ping pong paddle, I want you to bring it with you. I, I don't own the gear, dude. I just show up, take names, brother. <laughs> <laughs> loser, loser has to do something. Yeah, yeah, we'll come up with something. We'll come up with something. 
but listen, Some are it, equally embarrassing for one as the other. Yeah, I really appreciate your time tonight. And I really hope, you know, like I said, I know there's a lot of people wondering about you. You, you left a serious fan base behind here. I hope people come away with something. And, you know, I, I appreciate your time. Um, it's been awesome. Um, if you have any shout outs, you want to say thank you to anybody or whatever it may be, do it now. Tell them where to go find your sites and all that other stuff. Okay, well, I want to thank you. I appreciate the show and you digging in. We do this a lot off off record. Yeah. But, no, and you're inspirational to me too, man, with your show. So, you know, it's something I want to get more into is, you know, uh, internet influential stuff. So we started the website with Cyber and so that's ElliotFosky.com. You know, I started doing a written blog, but that's not really going to be my vein. It's hard to travel and write. There's no Wi-Fi. And, you know, I want to live in the moment. I don't want to go home and have to do homework writing about it. So I'm going to do a little more video blogging. So I just started a YouTube channel. Um, I already uploaded all my past promo Mohican Warrior videos and me talking stupid and having fun. Yeah, you could go see him. Yeah. In the, in the videos that he's posting, you could see he's in character 100%. This, this, you're not going to see this guy. <laughs> if you're looking at right now when you go to the videos, you're going to see the character of the Mohawk and everything else. What's the web? What's that address? For what? The YouTube? For the YouTube channel. Uh, man, I just opened it. What do we got it under? I, don't, I, I just I don't, changed it. I think it's just my name. Maybe my last name. <laughs> I think it's Fosky. Go to the Fosky, Fosky channel, man. I don't know. Go to YouTube and put an Elliot Fosky. I don't know. Hey, what, what's your What's your face? I, I, that's why you're inspirational to me, man. You got a name for your show. That's inspirational. <laughs> <laughs> what's your What's your, what's your uh, 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 Facebook handle? My My name Elliot Fosky is pretty much everything. Elliot Fosky Instagram, Elliot Fosky Facebook, Twitter is Fosky Eight. But you can look it up by my name, right? But, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, just Elliot Fosky. Is Google everything. his name, bang his name, whatever you want to do. Look up Elliot Fosky, stay in touch with him. I have a feeling he's going to be be keeping people way more informed uh, with his what's going on with him in the near future. So, you know. Once I learn this technology and get the name. You got it, buddy. Well, I appreciate your time and uh, I'll, up, buddy, and I'll talk to you soon, okay? I appreciate you guys. All right, thanks, Thank man. Yep, peace. Give it to the saxophone